Okay, uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as members' papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Uh, we've got a full house today, there's been no apologies from MSPs and we move straight to agenda item one. And the committee will take evidence on its inquiry into homelessness. And can I welcome this morning Kevin Shute, Minister for Local Government and Communities. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. And can I also welcome two of your officials here today. We're pleased to have David Signorini, Head of Better Homes, and Marion Gibbs, Team Leader, Homelessness Scottish Government. Thank you to both of you for coming along th this morning. Uh, Minister, uh, I believe you've got an opening statement to make before we move to questions. Uh, yes, please, Convener. And thank you to the committee for the opportunity to outline our plans to tackle homelessness and rough sleeping. Uh, in recent years, with strong housing rights already in place, uh, we have made significant progress in preventing homelessness before it occurs. The number of homelessness applications has fallen by more than a third since 2010, uh, with fewer families in unsuitable temporary accommodation. Uh, but we are not complacent. Uh, we know that now is the time to do more, building on the progress we have made to be more ambitious uh, now. Uh, we want to ensure that everyone, uh, including those with the most complex needs, is supported to secure a home that works for them and to achieve uh, the best possible outcomes for individuals. Uh, members of this committee and many people uh, across Scotland will be concerned by the apparent rise in the number of people who are sleeping rough. It is unacceptable in a country as wealthy as ours uh, and is why we have recently announced measures to address this. Uh, in our programme for government, the First Minister set a clear objective of eradicating rough sleeping uh, and we have moved quickly to establish the short-term Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group uh, chaired by John Sparks of Crisis. Uh, the group is already working hard to identify actions to address rough, rough sleeping this winter uh, and will report in the next few weeks on the actions they will recommend uh, on that time-critical initial question. Uh, in the coming months, uh, the group will also consider what further action is required to end rough sleeping for good um, and will also uh, look at how we transform temporary accommodation and how we can end homelessness in Scotland. Uh, we have also created the £50 million Ending Homelessness Together Fund over a five-year period, as well as investing an additional £20 million uh, in alcohol and drug services. The Action Group will consider options for the best use of the fund from 2018-19, and in the longer term, we will continue to work with local authorities and other partners through the Homelessness Prevention Strategy Group to drive change and improvement. I look forward to the recommendations of this committee, as it is clear to me that success will rely on all of us uh, working together. Uh, we face huge challenges, not least from UK government welfare reform, uh, but with the action-focused approach we are taking, we can make real, lasting change in Scotland, ensuring everyone is able to secure a safe and suitable home. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much for that opening statement, Minister. And we'll move to questions now. Andy Whiteman. Convener, thank you. Uh, Minister, you mentioned in your opening remarks the need for everyone to be um, working together, and that's been a key theme of evidence we've had uh, in this inquiry, and th the fact that homelessness is not just a housing problem, indeed it is often just a symptom of wider problems. Um, Alacho, in their submission, said that in the longer term there should be consideration of extending statutory obligations uh, regarding homelessness to a wider range of public agencies other than local authorities. Do you believe that would be helpful? Um, as the committee will be aware, convener, John Mills of Alacho um, is a member of the action group and I'm sure that he will convey um, the, uh, the views of Alacho uh, to the group. Um, I will certainly look at that very closely. What I have found, Convener, is I have uh, gone around the country um, speaking to third sector organisations, local authorities um, and people uh, who have lived experience of homelessness is that sometimes 
um, services are not joined up in the way that they should be. Um, I have come across some extremely good examples of where uh, local authorities and others have joined up uh, their approach to tackling uh, homelessness, uh, a person-centred approach, um, the preventative approach, um, and that works well. Uh, probably a good example that I could give the committee is uh, that Jean Freeman and I um, recently met with Dundee City, who have brought teams together, um, not only from homelessness, uh, but from the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, from energy effic uh, efficiency um, uh, uh, staff and others. Um, the approach that they are taking is one um, which I would like to see exported elsewhere. Uh, the best practice that is going on um, is discussed regularly at housing options hubs. Um, and I want to ensure that all of these hubs are aware of all of the good work that is going on, uh, wherever that may be, to pick up um, the best of what is going on and making sure that that becomes a reality right across the country. Um, beyond that, um, convener, I think one of the things which has been useful um, is that the Scottish Housing Regulator, in terms of the work that it's doing in Glasgow, um, has mapped out the journeys of a number of folk to see where things have gone right and where things have not gone so well. Um, and as well as looking at what the action group comes up with in terms of their recommendations, I'm also keen to ensure that we continue to look at what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And that um, work that uh, has been undertaken by the Scottish Housing Regulator, I think will help us pinpoint um, the areas where we need to improve, which may also be areas um, where joint working is not taking place the way that it should be. Suggestion that there is best practice out there, and we've seen some of it ourselves um, as well. But the, the question really is: Do we need a step change in the way we do funding for these services, and in particular the statutory obligations on key agencies, whether it be the health service or the prison service, to ensure that, albeit best practice is spread and learnt from, that best practice is embedded and becomes an obligation on the wide range of agencies that are dealing with the problems that contribute to homelessness. Um, I will look very closely at what the action group comes up with and what others are saying at this moment in time. I don't think that this is necessarily um, about uh, budgeting per se. I think this is about bringing people on the front line together to make sure that they are taking um, a person-centred approach to individuals. Um, because often uh, what we find is that we may get elements um, of helping people absolutely spot on right. But the element that we maybe get wrong is the one um, that drives them back into a, a homeless situation. Now, I think that we have to look very, very closely, um, and I know that the action group will be looking very closely, at where um, there may be difficulties in that regard. Um, in terms of some of the organisations which I know that you have visited as a committee and some of the organisations um, that I have spent time with, um, we can see quite clearly where the holistic approach um, works. Um, a good example, I think, is Tomorrow's Woman Glasgow, um, which does not follow um, the housing first pattern, um, but has put in place um, a, a, all of the agency support that is required um, to help women uh, not only retain their tenancies, but also to help them with other issues um, that may face. I think in some regards, uh, convener, um, legislation is not always the answer um, to these things. Uh, but what we need to do uh, is to make sure um, that we have services which are tailored um, to deliver in every aspect of an individual or a family's needs to ensure that they continue uh, to retain and secure a tenancy. Thank you, Minister. Is that okay for now? We can bring you back in later, Mr. Whiteman, if that, that's okay. So I've put it on the record, Minister, that we've got the Scottish Housing Regulator in front of our committee in a, in a few weeks' time, and I was aware of the work 
that he's doing in, in Glasgow and I think we'll be very interested to hear more about that not as part of this inquiry but come along to, to give evidence on their annual report anyway so just put that on the record for anyone following proceedings here uh, can we move to Graham Simpson yeah uh, thank you very much uh, morning Minister um, I just want to um, ask you about rough sleeping um, it's obviously very difficult but maybe impossible to put a, an absolute figure on how many people sleep rough um, but we've certainly had evidence that uh, in some parts of the country it's uh, increasing. Um, you've set up um, a homelessness and rough sleeping action group. Uh, and if I'm right, one of the priorities for that was to reduce, I don't think it was to eradicate, but reduce <coughs> rough sleeping this winter. Um, we're, we're already in the winter. <laughs> so how, how are you getting on? Convener, the action group um, first met um, at the beginning of October um, and they will meet again um, tomorrow um, and will provide me with recommendations of what we need to do uh, over uh, the piece of uh, 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 this winter. Um, the meetings themselves um, are, not, um, are, are not the only thing that's going on. Um, the action group has been uh, in constant, members of the action group have been in constant communication with one another um, to make sure um, that they get these things absolutely spot on right. Uh, Mr Simpson is right, that is their first task and I look forward uh, to hearing the recommendations um, that they have to make uh, on that issue. Um, and I look forward to getting that um, as soon as after tomorrow as, as possible for them. Given, given the fact that we're already in the winter and your priority was to reduce rough sleeping this winter, yeah. I would have expected something to have happened by now. Well, obviously, I'm going to look very carefully at what the action group has to say. There are already services which are in place for this winter. For example, the um, Edinburgh Night Shelter is already operational and has been since, if I remember rightly, convener, I think October the 23rd. Third, I'm looking at officials, but I think it's round about that. The Glasgow City Mission opened up um, recently uh, during the course of Storm Ophelia because obviously temperatures dropped at that time. Um, I will look very, very carefully at what the action group has to say and will move quickly um, uh, on their recommendations to make sure um, that we get as many folk off the streets during the course of this winter as possible. But beyond that, convener, it's not just about dealing with this, uh, uh, this winter in terms of rough sleeping. Um, one of the questions um, that the uh, action group will answer is how do we eradicate rough sleeping? And I think that's very important um, because it is all fair and well us putting emergency measures in place every winter. Uh, but what I would like to see, and I'm sure uh, what the committee would like to see, um, is the eradication of rough sleeping, uh, full stop. Uh, well, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's, uh, as you know, that's something we've been uh, looking at, um, uh, particularly on our recent trip to, to Finland. Um, so it sounds to me that uh, nothing has happened so far uh, to tackle the problems this winter. Uh, I've but already said to Mr. Um, Simpson, convener, that a number of measures are already in place um, in terms of winter shelters. But beyond but sorry, that, Minister, I, I those, think those shelters have existed for years. Sure. There's nothing new but in that. I, I think it would be unfair to say that nothing has happened because I know for a fact that over the past while, between October the 5th uh, and tomorrow, uh, when the uh, action group meets again, they have been working. Uh, very hard uh, to come up with solutions and recommendations which they will present to me. Anything additional, Mr Simpson? Uh, no. Okay, Elaine Smith. Thanks, Convener. Thanks for joining us, Minister. Just on the, the same issue of rough sleeping um, and, and following up on what Graham Simpson was asking you about there, the, the support that you, you talk about currently is, of course, mainly provided by churches who, who do a brilliant job in providing that, but... What do you think the role of the public sector should actually be in providing um, support for rough sleepers? Well, 
I'm very grateful um, to faith groups and to third sector groups for all of the work that they do um, in terms of dealing uh, with the issues faced by rough sleepers and uh, on homelessness issues in general. Um, I think that um, the work that is carried out by organisations such as the Bethany Trust, Glasgow City Mission um, and others um, is uh, extremely important to, um, uh, to, to what we are trying to do. Um, and I think that, um, I, well, I hope that they will continue um, to carry on with the engagement and the work that they have done over a, a number of years. I do think that um, uh, the public sector itself and local authorities um, also um, uh, have duties in, in these regards and we know that in many places um, uh, the, uh, the methods that are used um, and the facilities that are provided are provided by local authorities um, themselves in dealing with this. Um, obviously one of the things which I would like to see um, uh, is folks going in um, to temporary accommodation with the support that is required rather than a, a reliance on night shelters um, or hostel uh, accommodation. And I know that in terms of the committee's trip um, to uh, Finland that you have seen other examples of, of how things work um, there. Again, um, convener, we will look very closely at what the action group has to say. Um, the committee will be aware that um, the action group itself has uh, uh, the former moderator of the Church of Scotland uh, as a member and um, the Reverend Barr has been uh, pretty um, uh, interested in this subject, very interested in this subject for many, many years. So we will also uh, look uh, to see what recommendations they make uh, in terms of provision, uh, not only in the cities, but also in rural areas. And I'm quite sure um, that they will have uh, something to say uh, around about the provision that is currently um, undertaken by faith groups, including, as I say, Bethany Trust and Glasgow City Mission. Thanks, Kendina. Thanks, Minister. Um, Yes, I think, you know, as I said at the beginning, they do do a fantastic job, but I think we have to have some wider consideration to how the provision has, has worked. Could I just ask, uh, Minister, you said when, in your opening statement, you talked about the apparent rise in rough sleeping. I think if I'm right, that was the word you used. What I wonder is, um, why, did, why did you say apparent? And if it's because we don't actually have exact numbers then I note that Homeless Action Scotland has asked the Scottish Government if you would conduct a national audit to establish the number of people that are sleeping rough would you have any plans to follow that advice to do that? In terms of the most recent figures that we have um, of those that are presenting themselves as homeless um, there are two questions which are asked and uh, the first one is um, did you rough sleep the night before um, and have you rough slept over the last three months? Three. Three. Um, three months. The figure in terms of the night before um, has risen slightly in recent times. Um, out of those folks who are presenting, um, if I remember rightly, and I'll look to, to Marion to correct me if I'm wrong, that figure has risen from 7% of those pre presenting to 8% in, in recent times, a slight rise. The figure in terms of those folks who are saying that they've slept rough over the past three months has remained almost static. Those are the, um, the, the figures that we have, but we know and we have seen um, a, a, a rise um, of, of folks saying that they are seeing more people um, sleeping on the streets. So that's why I'm saying apparent. The figures are not necessarily matching the anecdote or what I have seen myself, basically, whether that be in Aberdeen or here in Edinburgh. Um, so that's why I use the word uh, apparent. In terms of uh, an audit, I think an audit is a, a very difficult thing to undertake. Uh, and when they have been done in the past, I'm not sure how accurate they have been. What I would rather see, convener, is efforts into uh, the actions of getting folk off the streets 
um, and into accommodation. Um, so that is where the focus lies, uh, and that is what the action group has been tasked to, to look at, uh, looking at, and to offering up recommendations um, uh, on. If the action group um, were uh, to come up with a recommendation to carry out an audit, obviously I would look at that. But I think the key thing for all of us here is not necessarily arguing around about the numbers of folk that are actually on the streets on any one night, but actually providing those folks with the accommodation that they actually need. Okay, can, I, can I just mop up a couple of things, Minister? You, you mentioned the, the Homeless Rough Sleeping Action Group, which we all very much welcome, and that recommendations will find their way towards you fairly soon. Will those recommendations be made public, Minister? Um, I, I would uh, be open and transparent, to, uh, and I'm sure that the group uh, want to be as open and transparent as, as they can possibly be. So, yes, um, all of those things will become public. That, that, that's very helpful, and also in terms of the increased visibility of rough sleeping, and I know from my constituency caseload, I have constituents tell me they see a more visible form of rough sleeping. In, in Glasgow, when the committee were visiting Glasgow, some of the, the charitable organisations said to us the nature of rough sleeping has changed. Um, and one of the, the theories, and they are theories, because we don't know for sure, Minister, is that whereas previously rough sleepers were maybe down alleyways or under railway archways, they don't feel safe there anymore. So they come in to the public spotlight because they actually feel safer in shop doorways than they did. In, so is, is there a culture around rough sleeping, perhaps, changing a bit and do we have to maybe better understand the, the real the lived experience of rough sleepers and why they're choosing to uh, if you like opt some of them are opting for that lifestyle but some of them are obviously been fueled by by services as well but is, is there a change in the dynamic of rough sleeping within scotland do you think i think that's a very difficult question for me to answer um convener obviously again and going out um, and talking to various organisations, um, you hear uh, about um, dif different individuals' experiences and uh, why they have maybe changed the way that they, they, they do things. But I think it's very difficult to give you a, 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 a straight um, answer to all of that. Obviously, we have seen um, in certain places a, a rise and begging uh, and the, the visibility, uh, increased visibility of begging in, in some places um, in Scotland. Um, and some of that may be down to the fact that um, changes in legislation um, from the UK government means that um, so many folk have got no recourse to public funds. And I, I think that that is an issue um, that the UK government must look to and, and address because I think that, um, you know, we are creating um, crises for people on a day-to-day -day basis because of that situation. The action group itself um, tomorrow, as well as that initial meeting, um, are going to be talking to um, a, a number of stakeholders. I think it's between 40 and 50 stakeholder groups that they're going to be talking to tomorrow. Um, that is maybe a, a question that we can ask them to pose tomorrow, convener, and give you more information um, on uh, in some more depth. Um, you know, I've got information that I've received from folk as I've been going out and about, but that's more anecdote than hard information, and I know that you will be wanting hard information, so we will try and get that for you. That would be very helpful. One, one final, hopefully brief question for myself before I bring in Jenny Goldruth to take on the, the que questioning further. Um, whilst n none of us want to see night shelters have to exist, they are going to exist this winter. Uh, is there an opportunity there, Minister, because when you get very vulnerable people forced because of the harshness of winter to present to, to night shelters, you have a cohort of people who are vulnerable who might have previously disengaged with services, that's a real opportunity to get them back into the system again. So is that something that you see as, as an opportunity and are you confident a plan in place to try and achieve some of that? Uh, absolutely, Convener. I think that um, what you are suggesting there should um, really become a matter of course. If we look at some of the work that Glasgow City Mission has done over past years, 
trying to link um, folks who are presenting at their shelter um, with health services and with others. Um, you know, there has been uh, some success um, in that regard. Um, and it is um, a, a situation where um, folks who often have lost confidence in people um, uh, come into the shelter and find um, that there are people who are willing to listen. And I think that's the key thing, willing to listen. Um, and then folk can help them, signpost them to the services that they, they require. Um, from my knowledge of what went on at Glasgow City Mission last year, um, that has been extremely helpful. Um, and uh, Glasgow City Mission themselves um, presented at the recent Glasgow Homelessness Summit, which I was at, um, and, you know, the work that they have done in terms of signposting um, is something that is being uh, done now by many, many other organisations. And long may that continue, because that joined up approach is the way uh, that we can help folk maybe get out of situations that they don't want to be in. Can you ask a little bit more of that later Absolutely. when we come on to Housing First, Minister, because there's, there's certainly links there, but Jenny Goldruth. Good morning to the Minister and the panel. Um, in previous evidence sessions, we've listened to the experiences of homeless people and a consistent theme coming out has been the experiences of care-experienced uh, young people going into the system and, and their experiences of homelessness. I just want, wonder, with regard to that specific point on care-experienced people, uh, if the Minister has a view with regard to how best we meet their needs. Um, convener, um, since taking over this role, I've had a, a number of bilateral meetings with ministerial colleagues, um, including with Mark MacDonald, the Minister for Early Years. Um, we have, at this moment, the care review going on, instigated by the First Minister, um, but we cannot just wait um, for its findings, uh, actions um, are required now. Uh, and we have already um, taken some actions in that regard to make um, life easier um, for younger folk um, who are leaving the care system um, uh, and who um, are moving into accommodation. Um, there are some barriers um, to what we um, are trying to achieve there because Obviously, um, the Westminster government has removed housing benefit for 18 to 21 year olds and the um, Scottish government has been able to mitigate that using the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure um, that these folks can continue to get support. Recently, um, the First Minister has announced um, that we will look to remove um, council tax um, from younger folk um, leaving care to set them on the, the right path. Uh, and beyond that, um, in terms of housing, housing options itself, um, we have a protocol in place um, for care leavers. But I recognise, and Mr MacDonald recognises, you know, that we, we must continue um, to ensure that we are doing our best. I've continued to speak um, to young folk themselves about their lived experiences and where the system has not uh, necessarily worked well for them. And that's why um, I want to ensure um, that the Housing Options Toolkit, which we're developing to help train frontline staff, um, has elements which deal um, exclusively uh, with those leaving care um, because you know these folks in the front line are key to ensuring that people young people move into uh, move on to tenancies which are sustainable so it's not just about getting them the house it's not even just about the support through um, the Scottish Welfare Fund if uh, a rent element is required it's not even uh, about that removal of council tax it's making sure that other elements are in place uh, for supporting these folks in tenancies um, convener I know that many of uh, the members around the table will have heard me um, speaking before um, from the bat benches um, about all of our responsibility as corporate parents to these young folk. Um, and I want to ensure that not only uh, elected members here, including myself, recognise uh, my responsibility, but I also want to ensure um, that councillors themselves recognise their role 
um, as corporate parents and ensure that the policies that they are putting in place at council level recognise um, their responsibility uh, to care leavers to make sure uh, that they are put on the right path. Because at the end of the day, um, those of us who have been lucky um, to live in pretty secure environments, and I'm 49 year years old convener, and to this day, um, I still rely on parental support from time to time. Um, and I'm sure that um, uh, applies to, to many of us. Now, that support may not be monetary, um, but it is advice. And it is ensuring that young folk have all of those elements to the, so that they can have the best possible start that we would want every young person to have. Thank you. And just on a supplementary, obviously, I'm sure committee members cannot believe, Minister, that you're 49 years old, but in terms of... Uh, the welfare benefit reforms in particular, um, we had obviously in September the national audit evidence that said that we'd had a 60% increase in England and Wales in terms of the homeless population and they laid the blame for that at the door of the UK welfare benefit reforms. The Simon community last week told us that UK welfare reforms were leading to longer stays in temporary accommodation and Shelter told committee a couple of weeks ago now it is unlikely that the Scottish Government will be able to sustain sustainably mitigate all of these changes in terms of the welfare reforms. Would you agree with that statement from Shelter? Uh, is there a shelf life to how long the Scottish Government is going to be able to mitigate what the UK Government is doing? Because there is obviously a disconnect there and a clash of political cultures. And secondly, would you agree with the fact that UK Government reforms themselves are disproportionately affecting certain groups of homeless people um, to a certain extent. So, for example, I'm talking about, we've talked about care experience, young people, but I would also put into that bracket women and their experience, and that came up last week at committee. Um, convener, I don't know how many of the committee members watched the STV documentary earlier on this week, um, but a number of the women uh, with families that they spoke to um, from Edinburgh um, were affected by um, the benefit cap. Um, and I think, if I remember rightly from the documentary, it was Siobhan and Melissa that talked about their experiences uh, of the benefit cap, which meant that they could no longer um, stay in the housing that they were in um, and were forced into temporary accommodation. Um, from, uh, from my perspective, I think that that kind of situation is completely unacceptable. And I don't think that the UK government, um, as the National Audit Office report points out, um, have done uh, due diligence in terms of uh, looking at the impact of the policies uh, that they are implementing. And the National Audit Office um, is quite clear in that report saying the work should have been carried out to look at those impacts on, on, on people. Um, and you can see directly um, from that STV uh, documentary the impact on uh, Siobhan, Melissa and their children. Um, and that is unacceptable. And while the uh, Scottish Government can mitigate um, a, a number of things, and, you know, bedroom tax mitigation is costing us £47 million pounds a year, um, we have talked already today about um, using the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure that 18 to 21 year olds who are housing, having housing benefit withdrawn are still helped here. Um, we've put additional money um, into discretionary housing payments in recent times. While we have done that, we cannot, we cannot mitigate every single aspect of, uh, of the cuts that are taking place. Um, and I know that um, this committee, uh, others and others, uh, have played with the um, UK government to, to rethink um, what they're doing. I would, I would ask them to take a long, hard look at the, uh, at the impact of, their po of what their policy decisions are having on individuals and families right across the country. Um, at the very least, um, you know, there is an ex expectation um, when uh, when we bring new policy to the forefront here in Scotland that we uh, carry out impact assessments. At the very least, they should be carrying out impact assessments uh, before introducing some of these policies. Uh, but, you know, uh, 
the STV documentary itself shows quite clearly um, that uh, that these changes are having major, major impacts um, on folk here. Um, convener, if I can maybe finish off with, with a point around about um, the um, benefit cap itself um, and um, how, uh, how uh, other things can be put in place to try and alleviate some of the difficulties that are there. Um, Glasgow City Council, uh, I understand, have done a, a piece of work um, looking um, at the families that are likely to be affected by the benefit cap who may be um, in rented accommodation that costs a little bit more, identifying them and then giving them the option of moving into um, social housing, which is often cheaper, thus you know, removing some of those difficulties. Um, that is something that other councils, I think, um, need to look at. I've spoken to a number of other councils um, and asked them to, to look at what Glasgow are doing um, and, and, and to, to see if they can do similar. I intend to write to all councils, the ones that I haven't spoken to, um, to see if they can do like, like, likewise. Because I think if we can try and head some of these difficulties off at the pass, you know, that saves families um, from having to, to resort to tem temporary accommodation. Thank you. Uh, Minister, my Deputy Convener just um, made a, a good suggestion there. It would be very helpful if we were cited in what correspondence went to local authorities and what kind of responses came back, if, if that would be appropriate. I'm more than happy um, to, to do that, Convener. Um, we touched upon um, uh, care leavers. Uh, I recently um, wrote to all councils around about um, uh, care leavers and their responsibilities and asking them what policies that they have in place. I am more than happy to share that information with the committee uh, and the responses to uh, And likewise, with what I've suggested there, I'm more than happy to do that. I'll bring Alexander Schutt in a question can I just, in a second. Can I just mop up a couple of things there? I'd, I, and I note in my briefing prepared for today's meeting that one of the issues has been the the management fees in relation to temporary accommodation have been have been taken away and taken out of universal credit. But we do have a note saying that the UK government transferred £22.5 million. Pounds. I have no idea whether that uh, was sufficient or not sufficient. I just know the figure is there and that it was distributed via COSLA. So a bit more information on that figure, if you have it today, Minister, and how the spending of that has been would be monitored. Um, convener, um, 22.5 million, is it enough? The answer is um, no. Um, we have had discussion with COSLA around about the distribution, as um, you have um, pointed out. Um, and in terms of uh, more detail, could you give me an, 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 an indication of what more detail you require? I may have to write to the committee um, in, in terms of more depth, but if, if you can give me an indication of what you're looking for, I may be able to answer today. Well, I think rather than, than do something off the cuff, Minister, perhaps we, we think as a committee what kind of detail we'd be looking for, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you on that as well. But it's certainly something we want to make sure we've, we've covered all the appropriate parts of evidence before we report and we're inquiries. So we'll, we would get back to you on that, Minister. One final mopping up point. Um, care leavers incredibly important. There's lots of groups out there who have at-risk transitions in their lives. Prisoners would be would be another one. Uh, former milit military personnel would be would be another group. I'm just wondering, is there a consolidated strategy across local authorities, uh, not just care leavers, as significantly and important as that is, but across all groups where there's you know at transitional points in their life that it's significant additional risk of homelessness, or that's something maybe that additional thought could be given to. In terms of um, veterans, convener, most councils have got policies in place um, around about um, about veterans. Uh, in terms of some of the other at-risk groups um, or others who may experience homelessness, one of the key things um, which um, we are doing is that housing options toolkit. Uh, and what we um, want to ensure is that training package um, is at the very best that it possibly can be 
to allow those folk in the front line to understand the difficulties that certain folk, certain groups of folk um, are going through. Now, I think quite possibly uh, my officials um, are, um, uh, I wouldn't say annoyed with me, but they're, they're maybe a little bit naffed off at the amount of things that I've asked to be added in um, to that toolkit because there are often... Uh, there are often things which we don't necessarily think about um, until we actually meet with individuals and groups um, and hear their stories. And I think that's why it's important that the committee has been out and about talking to folk. And it's why it's an important part of my job to, folk, to talk to folk with lived experience of homelessness. So, for example, um, recently I've asked officials to uh, look at uh, what we need to do in that toolkit in terms of dealing um, with um, folk from the LGBT um, community and particularly LGBT um, young folk. Um, I met with uh, a number uh, of LGBT young folk from uh, LGBT Scotland um, who came up with a number of things which quite frankly I hadn't thought about. Um, which I think needs to be built into the toolkit so that those in the front line can understand the pressures um, that certain folk um, uh, go through and have an understanding of, of what is happening in, in folks' lives. So that toolkit will cover um, uh, all, all gamuts of, of groups and, and folks. Um, I don't know if Marion wants to add a little bit to that because Marion has been at the, for, uh, at the forefront of this in terms of discussing with local authorities what is required. And we're at the stage where we're about to um, procure um, the toolkit itself. If I can maybe hand over to Marion. Marion, see, just before you come in, we definitely want you to come in. I should, should point out that uh, in terms of, Minister, you annoying your officials, they've got very good poker faces, but I perhaps annoyed Alexander Stewart, who annoyed a line of questioning on the toolkit. So we'll hear from you, Marion, but then we'll be bring Alexander Stewart in to develop some some some, some areas around that. Uh, Ms Gibbs, thank you very much. OK, um, well, basically, what, the way that the, the toolkit's been developed is basically a co-production model. So what we've had is all the local authorities being involved in it. All 32 local authorities have signed up to the toolkit, which I'm sure you um, recognise is quite a considerable feat in itself, uh, along with Glasgow Housing Association. And they've been working um, through the hubs to actually take this forward. And what they're doing is that it's not just local authorities on their own doing this and getting the procurement and all the rest of it. They've invited groups like Scottish Women's Aid, uh, Scottish Refugee Council, um, NHS Health Scotland to be involved in that production in there as well. So that we're trying to like capture all the sort of experience that's out there and try to make sure that the, the toolkit reflects the best stuff so that when, when it's rolled out that the um, individual frontline workers will actually have quite a good resource behind them uh, about how they do that. So it's, it, that's the sort of like area it is, and it is very much about identifying people who have got a, sort of an interest in that. So we've got um, Skills Development Scotland involved and interested in it as well. So it's looking at that wide thing. It's not just housing. It's looking at em employability aspects, financial management aspects as well, along with sort of the wider health. So there's a, there's a huge range of stuff in there. And as the Minister points out, then organisations like LD LGBT Youth Scotland have got a particular um, sort of offer, if you like, in there, in terms of like what we can, how we can actually develop, help develop services to be more responsive to certain groups in, in, in Scotland. Convener, I missed out one part of your question, I'm sorry, um, and I think it's maybe important that I respond to it. And you mentioned prisoners, and I, I failed to answer on that front. Um, we um, are setting out minimum standards um, under um, uh, the acronym is SURE, convener. You know that I don't really like acronyms, um, which is Sustainable Housing on re Release for Everyone, um, which should ensure the coordination um, when it comes um, uh, to um, release. Uh, beyond that, um, convener, in terms of 
uh, cross-cutting government response to deal with some of these issues. Um, the Justice Secretary, Michael Matheson, um, uh, chairs a, a ministerial group on uh, offender reintegration, which brings, I think it's eight ministers together to try and get things right for folk leaving prison. Obviously, housing um, is a, a major element in that and getting it right. Um, we're, we've had discussion uh, around about um, release dates uh, and things like that to make sure, um, you know, if somebody is being released at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, that does not give them the opportunity um, to go and deal with services. So we are, have had discussions around about getting all of that right to uh, I'm sorry to come back in, but I did miss out that element. I think it's important I put that on the record. No, that's very helpful. Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Minister, you, we, we've touched on this morning the toolkit, and I think that the toolkit is a, a, a huge opportunity uh, for us going forward. Uh, and during our evidence, uh, witnesses have been very supportive uh, of uh, the toolkit and the, the possibilities that the toolkit can bring. Uh, and you've, you've given some information this morning about the depth and the breadth of that. Uh, I mean, the size of the document and the scope uh, is, has great potential. Uh, but it's trying to ensure that as we develop it and as it comes forward, uh, it comes out. Is it your plan to bring it out in stages or is it your plan to develop it in certain sectors to ensure that, you know, you, you've, you've had given us examples today of organisations that we hadn't considered initially, which you're now considering. Uh, but I think, you know, to make sure that, that we get the purpose and the view that people want from the toolkit, it's very important uh, that they're not given masses of information that they're not able to disseminate uh, fully, that it comes out in a, in a way that they can benefit, because that was very much the evidence base that we were taking, that people felt that this could really be an, a huge advantage if we are hitting the specifics that they are considering and also uh, taking in views and opinions of individuals and organisations who have a big impact on this. Uh, Convener, uh, uh, a very good question and one of the things which um, we don't want is uh, an information overload or a training overload. Um, uh, so I think that uh, Mr Stewart is um, right in that regard. The toolkit itself will come in six modules, so that will um, split it all up. Um, beyond that, you know, there will be the flexibility um, to look at um, adding to, uh, to it at a later date if something else hits our radar um, from uh, an organisation. Uh, we've listened um, uh, to a huge degree um, from local authorities, but um, let me be quite clear that you know we have also listened to third sector partners uh, and to others, um, including those folks with lived experience of homelessness, to try and get this um, a, as good as we possibly can get it. Obviously, we will continue to monitor how how well it is working, and we will take feedback from those folks. Um, who um, are, are being uh, trained uh, and using um, the toolkit, it would be pointless if we were not to do so. To do so. Um, in terms of the amount of, uh, of listening that has been done, um, and as I say, as, as we have moved forward, there has been a, a, a fair number of discussions between uh, myself and, and, and Mary and another folk and her team. You know, we have picked upon things which we know um, may, we may not be getting right in certain uh, places um, and making sure that, um, that that information is in there to get it right. However, we have not just been complacent and waiting for the toolkit. Um, we have been disseminating good practice um, right across the board as we've been going on. Um, I, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to use a, a prop convener, which I wouldn't normally do, but woman um, in Fife, um, with the help of Scottish Women's Aid, put together this document, Change Justice Fairness, um, around about the experiences that they had um, in terms of uh, getting housing after um, having uh, to flee um, uh, domestic violence. Um, and, you know, this document itself, um, which has a huge amount of effort gone into it by um, these women with the support 
uh, of Scottish Women's Aid. As I've been going around the country speaking to folk, I've been bringing up this document time and time again. Fife um, Council um, have been working on the recommendations from this document in order for them to get this part of the service right. I know that other councils have taken cognizance of this um, and are now looking to do likewise. So it's not just about the toolkit itself, it is about this constant change that is going on with new information, um, which I think, you know, I, I would suggest that folk um, read this document. Some of the, the key findings in it um, are extremely important in terms of changing and reshaping services to get it right. Um, and as um, folk do these things, um, which is, are extremely worthwhile, we'll continue to update and continue to di disseminate. I'm sorry for using the prop um, convener, um, but quite frankly, um, the, the woman in Fife who have put this together um, deserve uh, a lot of plaudits and that we advert for the work that they've done. That, that, that's, that's a very appropriate thing to do, Minister. Uh, Mr Short? The, the, the toolkit, Minister, will obviously help many sectors, but those who have multiple and complex needs, it may be a, a, a real advantage to them uh, going forward. And we need to, to encourage agencies, and I know that has taken place already, to ensure that they try to redesign uh, some of their approaches uh, to, to ensuring that that does become a reality. But, but that's quite a hard nut to crack. Uh, to ensure that we get these agencies joined up, uh, that they're thinking about uh, some of the, the, the multiple issues, and that could have a, a health implication or a mental health implication as well. And, and it's how we're going to progress that uh, in, the, in the short and medium term uh, that I'd like some more information on. Um, convener, I'm glad that Mr Stewart used the words redesign. Because um, what I don't want to do uh, and I don't think any of us want to do, is reinvent. Because there is already a huge amount of work, good work, going on out there where all pieces of the jigsaw um, are completely and utterly joined up. And it's ensuring um, that um, public bodies, local authorities, housing associations, the health service, the entire shebang uh, realise um, that that way of working um, is the right way and actually um, can save a lot of money, um, but at the same time, um, the money aside, by not doing this, there's a human cost. So it's important that we take um, those best practices that are going on and making sure that they are replicated with redesign in certain areas to get this absolutely right. Now, I know that the committee has looked a lot at housing first and um, you know, um, there are a lot of things which are going on out there which are not necessarily housing first per se, but are very, very um, similar um, in that regard. And uh, Tomorrow's Women Glasgow um, is a very good example of bringing agencies together um, to ensure um, that um, there is that person-centred person approach um, in dealing with women who um, have had um, uh, often very, very difficult ba backgrounds, um, sometimes folks with extremely complex needs. Um, and th that kind of project itself, um, there is a natural progression, I think, in terms of other agencies suddenly wanting to become involved because they see the advantage of, of, of what is going on. Um, and hearing from some of the women at that project, um, you know, um, many of whom who were very cynical about criminal justice, um, they told me and Jean Freeman, who was with me that day, that Sometimes folks stray from the path a little bit um, and they find themselves in the criminal justice system again. But sheriffs in Glasgow or individual sheriffs in Glasgow recognised that they were um, taking part in this programme and were being helped by this project, recognised that fact and probably took 
different decisions from the ones that they would have because they knew um, what was going on and that that was an ongoing journey. So it's not only persuading the element, certain elements to come in at the very beginning. It is that additional folk coming in on board, recognising that if they are involved, that adds to the value um, and, and helps folk further along that path. You know, the, the whole idea of health and social care partnerships uh, coming together, uh, that gives us an opportunity once again to look at how we can focus. Uh, but in, in doing that, they need to have a, an active consideration of how they want to move things forward. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, we, we will see some of the benefits, I have no doubt, of, of health and social care uh, that will... Uh, in, the, in the, the long term, progress us. But in the short term, they, they, they have to consider the, the silos and coming out of that silo to try and support individuals. Uh, and, I, and I think that that has still got some way to go, Minister, uh, for that to be uh, resolved. Uh, and, I, and I think that you know, what you're doing already is supporting and helping, but the agencies themselves have to think about what they're doing uh, to make that become a reality. We are already seeing um, uh, many bodies looking at the evaluations um, that have been carried out uh, around about Housing First, um, including the Turning Point Scotland's uh, Housing First project evaluation, which was uh, put together by Sarah Johnson um, of Heriot Watt University. Um, now, you know, you don't even have to delve far into that report. Um, to see um, the very positive outcomes uh, of following um, that path. Um, and it is um, pleasing uh, that, um, you know, I, I think Aberdeen is probably one of the next ones that is uh, going to hold an event to look at how um, they can use housing first um, there. Um, now, as I say, it doesn't have to be the complete housing first model per se, but it is um, uh, the person-centred approach and ensuring that all of the elements required for that person to be able to sustain a tenancy and to have the help behind it are in place. Now, um, all of all of that means that um, you know there. It has to be psychologically informed. Um, folk have to know um, uh, what the real difficulties the the person um, is or the family is facing, and they have to make sure that um, they get the environment absolutely right in terms um, of of helping folks often um, with very complex needs. Now, you know, all of us. Um, around the table will have had constituency cases um, where somebody comes to us um, and gives us a, a problem um, that they need help with. But when you delve further down, often that's not the real problem. And we have to get better at that delving to see exactly what is required to help that person um, on their way, on that journey. Um, to sustain tenancy. Um, and that is extremely difficult um, with folks with complex needs who may be completely and utterly untrusting of, uh, of authority, of the system. Um, and that is why, you know, ensuring that those folks on the front line um, have um, the, the knowledge to be able to do that delving, to get that trust, um, and to have that empathy um, is the most important thing in all of this. Now, a lot of that we cannot legislate for. Um, we cannot legislate for empathy, for common sense. Um, but what I want to be able to do is to ensure that we provide all of the elements that are required to allow those folks in the front line to start that process to make sure that we get people on the right path with the right support. Thank you, Convener. Maybe we could time, Minister, just to mop up one or two things around housing first. I'll move to our next line of questioning after that with Andy Whiteman, who has got other matters that he wants to explore. The committee did 
did indeed go to Helsinki and we're moving towards a significant sympathy for housing first, but it's also point to point out, usually we get told half fidelity to the system. We were told something very different in Helsinki and in Finland. We said that if it works, it works. There's some key underlying principles. Housing first, do it in the context of your country and what works for you. But some of the underlying principles were certainly access to all services at, at, at the first point and at the point of emergency and of crisis. And that was integration of health and social care and housing. And that takes some significant realignment of budgets to achieve some of that and greater supply in the housing system. So the situation in Finland would be someone turns up in a state of emergency, may have to be briefly accommodated for a few days, is appointed a social worker pretty quickly and is offered a secure tenancy pretty speedily. Also, with all the wraparound services around that. Now, I know there are some small-scale examples, including my constituency with Turning Point Scotland. I suppose what I would ask you is the same thing I asked the First Minister uh, last week in relation to the budget lines around trying to achieve some of that. I see there's a £10 million a year Ending Homeless Together Fund. There's the £20 million a year Alcohol and Drug Services budget. But there's also a substantial... A, a, a AHIP budget, Affordable Housing Investment Programme budget, and I'm just wondering, in term, as well as the healthcare budget, in terms of aligning some of these budgets, can we bring some money into the system to create some new tenancies? Because supply is a key issue within the system, so supply is a key issue, but also there's an additional workforce issue. We need additional uh, care workers in the system, additional addiction workers in the system, additional social workers in the system. So we were impressed by some of what I, we saw in relation to Housing First. Uh, it's been tried on a small scale in Scotland. We know there's the action group. We're just trying to tease out further some of the government's thinking in relation to this and also what budget lines the government might draw upon to make some of this a reality. Convener, um Obviously, the action group will um, make recommendations probably around about funding too, I would imagine. Uh, and we can use the Ending Homelessness Together Fund, the new fund, um, to pilot uh, initiatives um, and look at what is required. You have rightly pointed out, um, Convener, that we have got um, a lot of money in the system. Um, uh, sometimes that doesn't always join up the way it should and I don't think that it, it's necessar necessarily um, the case of um, um, aligning budgets being the solution to everything but the alignment of people I think is extremely important and you know I go back to my point of the Dundee situation um, where you know you have got a team of folk working together who you know where one person is sitting at one end of the room dealing with somebody uh, in terms of homelessness but not just leaving it at that where they are immediately speaking to colleagues across the room and saying well this person might need something from the Scottish Welfare Fund here uh, or this person might need you know um, uh, something in terms of energy efficiency for uh, this their home or even in the case of Dundee going through in depth with a person um, their benefit entitlements and then working through with them what is required in terms of getting them the additional support that they require from the DWP that team approach you know where there's there's no one budget for all of that, convener. It's still different budget lines. But that team approach of everybody working together, I think, is the way forward. And I think that there are huge opportunities um, in terms of where we're at at the moment. Mr Stewart um, touched upon uh, health and social care integration. It is absolutely vital um, that health and social care partnerships uh, look at what uh, they uh, are doing in terms of housing and homelessness because a huge amount of the work that they um, will undertake, um, preventative work, 
um, is a, a, around about making sure that we're getting it right for individuals. Not just um, uh, homeless folk in, in the case of health and social care partnerships, but also ensuring that folk have got the right adaptations uh, in their homes to save them from going into um, to hospital or, or long-term care. So I think that there are huge opportunities um, at this moment with uh, wh where we're at in terms of getting this absolutely right. Homelessness itself is not just a housing matter. It is um, a cross public sector matter. That's one of the reasons why I've spent a, a huge amount of time uh, talking to colleagues in justice and in health and in early years and in employability um, to make sure um, you know that we are aligned in, ta in tackling all of this. Because we could move forward um, in, in taking uh, new approaches if we don't have everyone with us, everyone with us, then there are still folk who are going to fall through the cracks. So that's why all of these elements must come together. I will look very carefully at what the action group uh, has to say around about budgeting. I can also uh, assure the committee um, in the medium to long term um, that you know the homelessness and prevention strategy group, which we intend to um, uh, uh, to um, reinvigorate, um, will continue to look at all of these things too, and if necessary. You know, we will look at further how budgets can be aligned. Finally, convener, in terms of the affordable um, uh, housing uh, element of all of this, I would expect all local authorities and housing associations um, to look at the opportunities um, that our programme provides and ensuring that we have the right accommodation um, for homeless people. Currently, at this moment, um, Edinburgh City Council's allocations, 73% of their allocations go to homeless people. Across the country, the average is around about 40% uh, of allocations go to homeless people. I think that um, uh, you know, local authorities, housing associations, should continue to monitor their allocations policy to make sure they're getting it right for homeless people. And beyond that, um, folk who are homeless should also be benefiting from the new housing that is coming on stream. That's very helpful, Barrister. I suppose it's worth noting that uh, homeless people and rough sleepers are not always the, the same thing, and Housing First is very much focused at vulnerable people who find themselves on street at times of crisis. And, and there are supply side issues, which is why I deliberately mentioned the existing £20 million and £10 million budgets, perhaps for that support of the individual rather than just housing. But I mentioned the AHIP budget because there's a supply side issue. Um, should, and we're returning to this soon, Minister, ships, strategic housing investment programmes, which I know you take a great interest in, but sh yeah. should, should they be starting to align with, if we decide to back housing first, should they be starting to look at let's have a percentage of the units that uh, local authorities wish to see in the years ahead been designated as built on a housing first model to allocate some of these units to very vulnerable individuals, a housing first secure tenancy approach and align their support services for the most vulnerable people who will be staying in the Glasgow night shelter this year or the Edinburgh night shelter this year or the rough sleeping that takes place around Scotland. I'm just trying to get a tangible idea of what it could mean in practice. That's a meaty budget, that a hit budget but it's about the nuances of how that's spent and whether a housing first model should be directly aligned to that. Sure. Um, convener, um, I've said to the committee uh, before, in terms of uh, formulating their ships, um, councils should uh, look at the housing needs uh, and demands in their area. Uh, and that would include the housing need um, of folks who find themselves homeless in their area too. You know, we've talked at, uh, at length previously 
um, about local authorities ensuring that they have got uh, the right uh, provision for disabled people and disabled uh, families with um, disabled uh, members. Um, I would expect them to do uh, exactly the same thing in terms of looking at uh, on, of what's required um, in terms of of uh, moving forward with a housing first model, if that is what they intend to do. So yes, in terms of their housing needs and demands assessment, I would expect them to, to look at these elements too. Um, obviously, in formulating any policy on housing first, um, the authority would have to have the housing. So, you know, they are going to have to think about how... That may be existing housing convener. In some cases, that may be new. Um, but they will have to think about how they are going to provide that element in order to be able to, to move forward with housing first. I'm going to sneak in one final question. I've got two supplementaries on this from Kenneth Gibson and Graham Simpson. I'll take, take, take those MSPs in, in, in a second. Just, please just tease out a little further that same line of question as you'd expect me to... Minister, one of the things that, that happened in Finland is there was a relatively modest financial incentive from the centre in re relation to uh, lo local areas deciding to invest in housing first models. And in their case, I wouldn't necessarily follow this route in Scotland. They actually adapted a lot of former hostels into self-contained uh, one-bedroom flats. I'm not saying I would go for that. I'd probably go for a more scattered housing approach, I suspect in Scotland, but there was financial leverage and incentives from the centre. So I'm just wondering if nationally we decide housing first is the right way to go forward, could you envisage using budgets at the centre a bit more innovatively to incentivise local authorities to do some of this supply side issues around housing first? Um, because I get that the statutory duties sit with 32 local authorities, but we're developing a national action plan, so it's about getting that balance right, about driving leadership from the centre and allowing local discretion. Convener, I will look very carefully at the recommendations that come from the action group. Beyond that, um, I will look very carefully um, at the findings of your committee. I've got um, uh, the report... Um, from your trip to Finland. Um, I think it would be fair to say, convener, that I've not read it in as much depth um, as I would like to. And beyond that, um, it may well be that I have a number of questions for you, if you don't mind, around about um, your visit to see what, um, it, 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 what has worked there. We come at this from a, a different um, uh, angle from the finish because obviously we have got different legislation and stronger um, homelessness rights but I am willing to look um, at good examples from anywhere and everywhere to try and get this right what I would not want um, convener um, is to push from the centre um, a s system which may not work in a, in a particular place because I think the delivery of housing first is likely to be a lot different in the likes of Glasgow or Edinburgh compared to some of our more rural towns and rural areas. And I think we have to allow that flexibility. But what I am always willing to do, um, convener, is look at all aspects of how um, how we can take that best practice from wherever it may be and get it right for them. In terms of the budget, um, budgets themselves, um, the Ending Homelessness Together Fund give us, gives us an opportunity um, to pilot certain initiatives and to see what works and what does not. That then will allow others to look at their budgets and where they maybe need to realign, whether that be budgets at a local authority level, level or whether that be our budgets. So, you know, I think there's a wee bit of learning that we may, may need to do in terms of from some of the pilot initiatives, which I think are inevitable in terms of, of where we're likely to go. That's very helpful. And I suspect that I'm speaking for the committee if I say that I think we'd appreciate an ongoing dialogue, perhaps not even in a formal evidence session that and a discussion would, would be very, very helpful. So we might take you up on that offer at a later date in relation to what our experiences were 
uh, elsewhere. So we thank you for that, Minister. A couple of supplementaries on this, Kenneth Gibson, to be followed by Graham Simpson. Well, thank you very much, uh, Convener, because it leads on from what you've actually been saying. And indeed, the Minister has just said that he's, he doesn't really favour a push from the centre. But of course, the, in Finland, that was exactly the model that worked because they, there was a, a need to get kind of um, all party buy in and, and uh, to get buy in from across the country. And so there was a push from the centre. And the emphasis that I'm pretty sure that, that we received from the Mayor of Helsinki was, who was Housing Minister at the time this came forward, was that that's the only way to really get kind of a, a significant <coughs> delivery in terms of Housing First. And if we think about what the witnesses said to us last week, they absolutely were overwhelming in suggesting that Housing First should be implemented at the earliest uh, possible opportunity. So there's like really a, a couple of questions I was wanting to ask. The first one was really was, um, you talked about 40% of allocations being for homeless people, but uh, in your view, should housing be built specifically for homeless people? because that's obviously what they do in Finland and that's the model they feel works, whether it's in the uh, scattered housing or indeed the more communal uh, approach. And the other question is, uh, there's been a lot of talk this morning about cross-cutting budgets, etc., and indeed the Ending Homelessness Together Fund, but I'm just wondering what work the Scottish uh, Government has actually done in terms of a cost-benefit al uh, analysis to look at the impact of Housing First, uh, not just in terms of the, the, the cost of delivering such a model, but what the savings might possibly be in terms of uh, local government, um, health, uh, justice, etc., in, in terms of that, and uh, relative to other uh, kind of homeless provisions that we have at the moment in Scotland? Um, convener, first of all, um, when I talked about I don't want to push from the centre, I, I, I certainly want to push from the centre and make sure that folk are doing all they can to eradicate rough sleeping and homelessness. What I don't want to do is be dictatorial um, in, in terms of saying this is a system that you should use without... Um, flexibility. So maybe I got my wording a little bit wrong here because the push um, from the centre very definitely is um, in ensuring that uh, eradication of rough sleep sleeping uh, and that the move forward to um, ensure that we're providing the right services for homeless people. Um, uh, in terms of my view, uh, should we provide housing for homeless people only? Um, I think that's um, a very difficult question to answer and there are many views and all of that because, um, you know, for example, um, uh, in my days in a council, what we did was ensure that our temporary accommodation um, was spread throughout the city. Um, there was a logic to that to ensure that particularly um, folks with um, families could still, you know, attend the same school or have that family support network. Um, the same went for individuals. If, if you were taking somebody away from their family support network and putting them at the other end of the city, often that was not, um, uh, not particularly wise. So I, I think, you know, I, I, I think that in some cases... It may be an idea of, uh, of, of having folk together and building uh, the right accommodation um, for folk uh, who are homeless. But in other cases, I think you've got to have that flexibility so that support networks are, are still there. So I don't think that there is one, one way of doing this. And I, I think Mr Gibson would... Uh, yeah. A scattered approach. I think, yeah. I, I, I think that, that's something that we approach. could definitely look at. And, you know, um, I'm willing to have further discussions around about um, your experiences, it, formally or informally. In terms of Mr Gibson's question about cost-benefit analysis, um, there's some work um, going on in Renfrewshire at this moment um, around about um, that cost-benefit analysis. Um, I would have to say um, that, from my perspective, I think we need to do much more work uh, on that front. Um, and, you know, um, we will continue um, to look at that situation. I think, beyond doubt, without having all of the, um, all of the figures necessarily behind us, you can see from the evaluation, uh, turning back to the evaluation in Housing First and Turning Point Scotland, um, and how uh, individuals' lives have changed 
um, you can see quite clearly from that, um, you know, um, that what is not happening is a huge amount of spend on crisis, which is always the most costly. Um, so while I, I think we can share what we have from Renfrewshire in terms of cost be benefit analysis, I don't think that goes far enough yet. And I will uh, say to the committee that we will continue to, to do more work in looking at cost benefit analysis. But I would definitely um, point to the, the reports that already exist, which shows that crisis um, goes down, which means crisis spend goes down, which, you know, that kind of preventative spend is, is definitely the way that we should be moving forward. I'll share the Renfrewshire stuff that we have, um, and I will try and provide the committee uh, with more of that cost-benefit analysis as we move on. Now, uh, I just want to give a time check, because we are beyond our time. We've got a supplement from Graham Simpson, which I'm going to take, and I've got two specific lines of questioning that I know are still outstanding from both Elaine Smith and from Andy Whiteman. I would intend taking both of those. I know it's a forlorn hope, but I would hope to have that disposed of by around 11 o'clock, so I'm in the hands of members and the Minister in relation to how we get on with that. Yeah, OK. Uh, Mr Simpson. Hey, um, it very much follows on from uh, uh, what Mr Gibson and Mr Doris uh, was were, was asking. Um, and it fo yeah, re really follows on from our visit to, to, to Finland. Um, it, the Housing First program there was driven by a, a government minister, now the mayor of Helsinki. He didn't force it on councils, but he got buy-in from them. Yeah. And it seems to me that's the way to do it. He's quite, it comes across as quite charismatic guy, uh, but he managed to, uh, and I see you're smiling there, um, but he did manage to get that buy-in from the 10 biggest councils. His starting point was, we want, we do not want to see the homeless shelters in, in our cities. And they don't have them anymore, because they've converted them. Um, so are you, are you prepared yourself to perform that kind of role as a kind of housing first leader, champion in Scotland, to get councils on board without forcing them to do things, persuade them and put in extra resources because they also did that in Finland? Um, convener, um, the answer simply is yes. I don't know if whether um, I would be regarded as charismatic or not. Um, convener, um, one of the, the key things um, that I've done over the the piece is to bring um, local authorities together with a mix of folk, um, not only at director and head of service level, but folks who are at the front line um, to, to try and ensure, um, you know, that we are all on the right path. The thing that I want to do is make sure that best practice um, is exported right across the country. I want every local authority to be doing its very best uh, to help the most vulnerable folk um, in uh, our society. They have got a huge amount to benefit uh, uh, from uh, changing the ways that, uh, that things have been done. Um, because we cannot uh, have a situation where we deal with crisis only. Uh, we have to move to a situation uh, where uh, we um, are uh, helping people um, uh, with their needs and to become more person-centred. If we look at where the journey that we have travelled um, in terms of uh, homelessness in Scotland, since 2010, um, the amount of folk presenting as homeless has reduced by 39%. Um, you know, we can continue uh, to ensure um, that we are building new homes and that journey, um, getting folk into houses who don't need any additional support is, um, is quite easy in some regards. What we now need to concentrate on is those folks who are more vulnerable with much more complex needs and must ensure that those 
that services are aligned to help them to be able to sustain tenancies. Now, that is going to take a huge amount of work. Um, Programme for government, as the First Minister outlined, shows that this is a priority um, for this government. Um, in terms of what I've done since taking office, and particularly going out and speaking to folk, I realise um, that we have got a journey to go on. I want to be um, in the driving seat on that journey, and I want to take folk with me to ensure that we do our very, very best um, for folk out there. Um, some of this, um, convener, is not going to be easy. Um, and what we require is a degree of partnership working, not just with local authorities, um, but with the third sector um, and with other stakeholders to make sure that we get this absolutely right. I think that what we're going to get from the action group um, will set us on the right track in terms of the recommendations. But beyond that, we must continue on after their work to make sure that we deliver. And that is why, you know, the reinvigoration of the Homelessness Prevention and Strategy Group, um, which we co which I co-chair with, uh, with COSLA, is vital in ensuring that we continue on that journey and we get absolutely um, the right services in place right across um, the country. Okay, Mr. Simpson. I'm sorry if that took too long. Um, that's okay, Minister. Um, just always put on the record when we finish talking about housing first that even in Finland they would say it's not ended rough sleeping completely, it's ended rough sleeping as they used to know in Finland. And one service user told us their next big challenge, their next third wave of the policy is to engage with those who have completely opted out of engaging with services who are sleeping in tents in the forests in Finland. So it's not a silver bullet to solve uh, rough sleeping. It's a great pathway, speedy pathway for those who engage with services at that first point of crisis. And it's always important, I think, to put that on the record because these big initiatives pop up and it's seen as a silver bullet. We're not saying that. We're just very keen to see how it could be rolled out successfully in Scotland. Two lines of questioning left. Uh, the first one, Elaine Smith, MSP, to be followed by Andy Whiteman, MSP. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, Minister, you mentioned the SCV documentary earlier, but also in that documentary, the issue of standards of temporary accommodation was raised. So can I just ask you specifically about that? In the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, um, the government committed to developing minimum standards for temporary accommodation based on the equivalent standards for permanent social housing. So I'm wondering if you could give us an indication of how you see this being achieved and when these changes will be introduced. And I do appreciate, given timescales, you might want to write to us with further detail. Um, convener, I know the interest that Ms Smith has on this particular issue, um, and I'm more than willing to meet with her again individually if that's what she wants to do in this regard. The action group itself is going to look at temporary accommodation, including minimum standards. Um, Ms Smith is um, uh, well aware um, you know, that I, I, I want to ensure that um, temporary accommodation um, is of the best possible standard. 82% um, of families in temporary accommodation are in mainstream social housing. I want that figure um, to grow. I don't want um, to rely um, on unsuitable uh, accommodation. The government is also, uh, is, uh, the committee is aware, um, reduced the amount of time that folk can uh, spend in unsuitable accommodation from 14 days to seven days. I would rather um, convene her that that was zero days, but I also um, uh, am aware, as the committee will be, that sometimes there are these uh, uh, emergency situations where something has to be put in place quick. Uh, beyond that, it is often more difficult um, in rural areas um, to give folk temporary accommodation in the social housing setting, particularly in smaller places. And rather than have folk move away to other places, you know, we have got to have um, some kind of flexibility there. So the, um, the action group will look at the minimum standards in some depth. We will look at their recommendations. I have to say, um, uh, uh, convener, um, I was horrified um, at uh, what one of the women had to say on the STV documentary, um, and I will be following that up because I want to know 
um, exactly what happened there and what accommodation that family was put in um, so that that can never happen again. Thank you very much, Minister. And yes, uh, I might be taking you up on that kind offer, but I'm sure the committee are also interested in, in the issues. Um, and there has been a suggestion that the order that you mentioned could be extended to other groups such as young people, but I'll leave that sitting there just now because I'd quite like to turn to um, the, the issue of the people present as homeless. And of, of course, it's widely acknowledged that we have some of the best homelessness legislation in Europe, if not wider. However, we did hear evidence that um, sometimes people's, people are not able to access th their rights under that legislation. So for example, Thomas Lyon, who gave evidence to the, the committee, he'd, been, he'd spent six and a half years on the streets in Glasgow until um, the, the LSA actually got him put into a temporary furnished flat. And we do hear that there does seem to be some kind of gatekeeping going on. I'm sure we know from our own constituency, casework too, that sometimes people do have to go and seek assistance from the LSA, Govern Law Centre, and then go back to the local authority, telling the local authority what their rights are. And so therefore I wondered um, how you would respond to some of the concerns we've heard about that. Um, convener, um, first of all, I, I would like to um, thank those or organisations that advocate on behalf of homeless people. Um, and Ms Smith has mentioned a, a number of them there. There are many others and um, hats off to them. People um, should not have these difficulties. Um, I myself, um, uh, after a um, situation last year um, where... Alistair Cadona um, went on hunger strike um, outside this parliament. I went and spoke to Mr Cadona about his experiences, as I know Mr Whiteman did too. Um, and there was a lot of concern around about um, Glasgow City at that time um, and that gatekeeping situation. Um, and the Scottish Housing Regulator... Um, has been looking at that very closely um, indeed. And I mentioned at the very beginning, I think, around about those journeys that the regulators looked at. Now, I would be um, extremely unhappy if that kind of gatekeeping is going on. I would want to know about it. Um, I would want um, the Scottish Housing Regulator to be made aware of it too, um, because people have rights... They have rights in legislation and no one should be uh, sitting there acting as a gatekeeper. Thank you. So I know Andy Whiteman wants to follow up on some of these issues, so I'll leave it there. That's very helpful. Uh, Elaine, thanks very much. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you, Convener. I have a few very, very brief questions and there's no need to elaborate too greatly in your answers with respect. Um, we heard from the Legal Service Agency that they regard the Code of Guidance on Homelessness as, as out of date. Are you happy to consider updating it? Um, we will uh, consider what the Action Group has to say and we will look... Uh, I am willing to consider uh, uh, most things, as Mr uh, Whiteman is well aware. I think that what we need to do is we need to have a good hard look at what is there at this moment in time. We have 150 pages uh, of, uh, of guidance there. Um, I will look at that and make any necessary um, changes from the recommendations, not only of the action group, but also of the further work that will no doubt go on in terms of the strategic group too. We're putting housing options on a statutory basis. Do you have a view on that briefly? Um, uh, again, um, uh, housing options has been done here voluntarily. Um, it has worked particularly well uh, under uh, a, a, the, the voluntary setup. I know that other jurisdictions are looking at putting it on a statutory footing. Um, I will look what comes out of there. Um, I have to say, um, as I've said previously, um, legislation is not always the panacea to everything. Um, I think ho housing options is working well. If it transpired at any point that um, that was not the case, um, then I would rethink my position. But also I will look at what is happening in other jurisdictions and what, what comes out of what they're doing. OK, thanks. Just one final question. Elaine Smith mentioned a witness, Thomas Lyon, who gave us evidence on the 20th of September 
in which he opened his comments by saying, the reason I became homeless was that I had a private let at the time and the council were paying for it, but my landlord went bankrupt. We're about to consider commencement orders for the Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Act, um, but is it right or wrong that someone like Thomas Lyon should be plunged into the nightmare of homelessness merely because the landlord went bankrupt? I think that we should do everything possible to ensure that folk uh, do not enter into homelessness. We know that there are various situations which go on um, in people's lives which are not of their making. And I think, you know, that um, in terms of services, um, I know from my own constituency experience um, that, you know, local authorities um, could do uh, more in certain cases uh, to keep folk out of homelessness. But, but, but is it right or wrong that he should be made homeless because his landlord went bankrupt? I, I, I think, um, you know, in almost every case, it is a wrong that somebody uh, becomes homeless. I, I don't know the specifics of that case, so it's very difficult for sure. me um, to comment on it. Uh, what I would say is that I think in circumstances which are not of people's own making, um, then, you know, uh, local authorities and others should be stepping up to the plate to help them out of those okay, situations. Thanks, Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, and thank you to your officials. That concludes this particular evidence session, this agenda item. Now, before before I briefly suspend, just to allow witnesses to change, just stay with us, Minister, of course, uh, can I say to members that we'll get a comfort break once we've disposed of all the statutory instruments. So I'll suspend briefly just to allow some of the witnesses to change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll recommence the meeting and we move to agenda item two. And the committee will take evidence on three affirmative statutory instruments which provide regulations for the Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Act 2016. And can I welcome back Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government and Housing. Thank you, Minister, for staying with us. Uh, and can I also welcome uh, Linda Leslie, Team Leader, Private Rented Sector, and Kirsten Simonette Lafayette-Fervey. I apologise for the pronunciation of your name. You, you, you can... We should have asked Mr Gibson to do it. Uh, Kirsten, thank you very much and my apologies for that. Uh, Principal Legal Officer, Scottish Government. Uh, these instruments are laid under affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve them before the provisions can come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited to the next agenda items to consider the motions to approve each instrument in turn. So, Initially, can I invite the Minister to make a, an opening statement? Uh, convener, I'm pleased to be here today to present three affirmative instruments that support the introduction of the new private residential tenancy. Uh, the UK Housing Review 2017, published by the Chartered Institute of Housing, acknowledges Scotland's flagship housing policy. Uh, the report says the Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Act 2016 marks the most significant reform of private renting in more than a quarter of a century. It goes on to say that new PRS tenancies will be open-ended and significantly more secure through the virtual ending of no-fault eviction. 
Uh, in line with the core principles of the Act, our new tenancies will indeed improve security, stability and predictability for tenants and provide appropriate safeguards for landlords, lenders and investors. I'll, I'll touch very brief, briefly on the content of each in instrument that is before you today. Uh, firstly, we have the Private Residential Tenancies Statutory Term Scotland Regulations 2017. Uh, here we prescribe the statutory terms which must apply to all new private residential tenancies. The terms in the schedule of the regulations cover mat matters such as rent receipts, rent increases, notification about other residents, subletting and access for repairs. All these uh, terms mirror those contained in Schedule 2 of the 2016 Act. All these terms have therefore been previously approved by the Scottish Parliament, with the exception of paragraph 9 of this schedule, which is an addition and makes clear that a tenancy may not be brought to an end except in accordance with Part 5 of the Act, which deals with termination. Secondly, we have the Private Residential Tenancies Information for Tenants Scotland Regulations 2017. Uh, here we prescribe the information that a landlord must give to a tenant at the beginning of a new private residential tenancy. Uh, where a landlord chooses to use the model private residential tenancy agreement, a tenant must uh, be provided with accompanying easy read notes. Otherwise, where the written terms of the tenancy are drafted by the landlord, the landlord again must supply alternative accessible notes called private residential tenancy statutory term supporting notes. And lastly, convener, uh, we have the Private Housing Tenancy Scotland Act 2016 Consequential Provisions Regulations 2017. Uh, this is a routine technical instrument which amends various primary and secondary legislation in consequence uh, of the 2016 Act. Uh, that gives a, a very brief overview of the regulations, convener, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you very much, Minister. I appreciate that. Uh, I'll throw it open to committee members. Are there any questions at this point? No. I... Can I ask? Yes, Elaine Smith. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, it's just a question, Minister, that Citizens Advice Scotland had raised about the serving of notices, so that there was some um, concern that the notices served electronically might be missed by some people and that could have consequences. Pass to Linda in the first instance, convener. Good morning. Um, we consulted on um, serving notices electronically and um, a, a number of, of uh, responses highlighted the, the same concerns that um, Citizens Advice Bureau have. Um, the 2016 Act does permit um, tenants and landlords to communicate electronically, but we've made it very clear in both the model tenancy agreement and the easy read notes that that is something that they have to agree to do. And we have also spelt out in the easy read notes that um, in doing so, tenants should, in, in considering whether they want to do that, tenants should be very um, thoughtful about whether or not they want important information like changes to their terms of tenancy or so on to be served electronically rather than in, in writing. So it remains possible for landlords and tenants to um, use written communication. Um, the model tenancy agreement provides a, sp a specific clause which makes um, the landlord and tenant consider whether they w how they want to do that. There's nothing that forces tenants to agree to electronic communication. Thanks, Karina, because I think one of the concerns is, having agreed to that, if a single email was missed, then that could perhaps result in um, a notice of a tribunal to evict someone being missed. So, you know, there are some inherent dangers even in agreeing to it if you, if you think that you, you can work that way, but obviously accept what... Uh, I, hope that, I hope that um, that gives Ms Smith some comfort. If there's any other information in that regard that um, is required by the committee, then we'll pass that on. Uh, and as per always, convener, we'll continue to keep an eye on, on these things after implementation. Okay, thank you much. Are there any more questions? 
OK, well, we then move to agenda item three, still subordinate legislation. And for this item, the committee will formally consider motion S5M08087, calling for the committee to recommend approval of the draft local government and communities committee recommendations that the Private Housing Tennessee Scotland Act 2016, Consequential Provisions Regulations 2017. Uh, we now move to a debate section. Only the minister and members may speak in this debate and can invite the minister to speak... Uh, in relation to the debate and to move motion S5M 08087. I think I've said what I need to say, convener, and I formally move. OK, thank you. Are there any contributions from members at this point? OK, there have been none. Can I ask the Minister if he's got any further comments to make uh, and to sum up if he wishes to do so. I'm happy for you to move on, convener. OK, so the question, therefore, is that motion S5M08087 in the name of the Minister for Parliamentary Business uh, be approved. Are we agreed? OK, thank you. The committee will report on the outcome of this instrument shortly. Um, we now move to agenda item four. Uh, and for this item, the committee will formally consider motion S5M07895, in this instance, calling for the committee to recommend approval of the draft local government and communities committee rec uh, recommends that the private residential tenancies information for tenants Scotland regulations. We once again move to a formal debate section uh, and remind that only the Minister and members may speak uh, at this point and can invite the Minister to speak and to move motion S5M 07895. I formally move, convener. Okay, thank you. Uh, any members get any comments to make at this point? Okay, uh, that being the case, uh, can I ask the Minister whether there's anything he would wish to sum up? in relation to this? No, convener. Uh, there have been none. Uh, the question is that motion S5M07895, in the name of the Minister for Parliamentary Business, be approved. Are we agreed? Okay. okay. The committee will report on the outcome of this instrument in due course also. Now moving to agenda item five, still subordinate legislation. And for this item, once more, the committee will formally consider uh, another statutory instrument, which is motion S5M07899, calling for the committee to recommend approval of the draft local government and communities committee rec re recommending that the private residential tenancy statutory term Scotland regulations 2017 be approved. Uh, once again, we're getting the structure here. Only the, only the minister and members may move uh, may speak in relation to this debate. Uh, so can I once again invite the Minister to speak and to move motion S5M 07899. Uh, formally moved, convener. I'm delighted to hear you're formally moving that, Minister. Um, do members have any comments to make at this stage? Okay. Once again, there have been no comments. Uh, can I ask the Minister to sum up if he wishes to do so? Uh, uh, at no this thanks. point? No thanks, Convener. Okay. Uh, so therefore, uh, the question is that motion S5M07899, in the name of the Minister for Parliamentary Business, be approved. Are we all agreed? Okay. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you to your officials. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will move to agenda item six. Uh, we don't escape subordinate legislation just yet, members. We've got some more items of subordinate legislation. Uh, the committee will consider negative instruments 295, 296 and 297 as listed on the agenda. These instruments are laid under the negative procedure, which means that the provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on a motion to annul these instruments. Uh, I can inform the committee that no motions to annul have been laid. Uh, can I therefore invite members to make any comments they may have in relation to these instruments? Okay, there have been no comments. Can I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Are we agreed? Well, we got there in the end, uh, uh, committee. Um, we'll just suspend briefly for a comfort break before we move to agenda item seven, which is city region deals.
Um, okay, can I welcome everyone back and we now move to agenda item 7, which is City Region Deals. And the committee will begin to take evidence on its inquiry into City Region Deals. And can I welcome Professor Duncan McClellan, Policy Scotland, University of Glasgow, Dr Peter O'Brien, Research Associate Centre for Urban and Regional Development Studies, Newcastle University, Leslie Warren, Policy and Public Affairs Officer, Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, Barry McCulloch, Senior Policy Advisor, Federation of Small Businesses, and Chris Day, Policy Advisor, Transform Scotland. Can I thank everyone for coming along here uh, this morning? Sorry for the short delay in starting this particular evidence session, and we'll move straight to questions. So can I ask Mr Simpson to open up on behalf of the committee? Thank you very much. Um, so, the the background to our inquiry is, um, if I can be blunt with you, concerns around the Glasgow City deal that some members of this committee have had. Um, so, my opening question is, uh, I guess, a general one. Um, you don't all have to answer it, but anyone who wants to can. Um, have you done? Have any of you actually looked at a, a comparison between the? The, the deals that uh, exist uh, in, in England um, and the Scottish ones, particularly Glasgow, uh, to see how how they're operating and uh, you know whether you think there the could have been improvements in, the, in in any of the Scottish deals. And I can be a bit um, unobservant, so please catch my eye if you're desperate to speak. Ah, Professor McClellan. Um, I should make clear that I'm speaking in my academic capacity rather than as a commissioner on the Glasgow City deal, uh, but I, I'll happily uh, tell you what I think of the process. Uh, I think the Glasgow City deal um, arose in many ways uh, in a process similar to the larger deals in England, although there were exceptional political circumstances in the period uh, of its formation. I think it was formed very quickly, like a lot of the other deals. It focuses heavily on transport, uh, and I think that was a characteristic of all the early deals. And it comes out, in my view, of a technical mistake, whereby cost-benefit analysis in transport always gives people hard numbers, whereas other infrastructures that might have been more growth and productivity supporting are much more difficult to put on the table. I don't think any of the city deals have actually identified the infrastructures you require uh, to create productivity, to create innovation districts, and I don't think they've been imaginatively used in the UK. I served for five years as chief economist in the Federal Department for Infrastructure in Canada, and when we had infrastructure programmes, we looked much more closely about how you could create innovation districts in Toronto or the like. So I think that Glasgow was similar in that regard. The difference for Glasgow uh, from England is the Scottish Government's emphasis on inclusive growth has actually meant the discussion about where the impacts fall and who benefits is actually, I think, been more acute than in the English deals. Uh, and I think that the particular arrangements whereby there is a commission rather than just a national evaluation uh, puts a bit of focus, and Anton Muscatelli uh, chairs the commission, uh, so there is a fair amount of economic scrutiny of what's going on within uh, the Glasgow City deal as a set of projects. So I think it's different in some regards, but uh, similar in others, but that was part of the point of the exercise. They were all bespoke. Yeah. Uh, Dr O'Brien, do you want to add to that? Yes, I think um, part of the challenge is these things aren't static, they're evolving as we, as we sit here and discuss these issues. So particularly in England, and this is based on the research that we've done across the UK, but also increasingly in Australia, where you're seeing city deals sort of develop, is that right at the outset through the coalition government uh, at Westminster, there was an appetite to remove any notion of uh, overt performance management of city deals and metrics and a sense of kind of how you benchmark and measure how the city deals are going to be delivered. I think ministers there were very clear they wanted a clean break from what they saw as a target-driven culture uh, of the previous uh, uh, government. And so civil servants were informed, as far as we understand it, not to kind of uh, instigate a national or an English kind of uh, performance management framework. Then when ministers were asking the question, how are these things 
going and doing, it was very then very difficult. So retrospectively, there had to be a kind of system introduced across the different city deals in in England. So it's it's been, it's still too early to tell to some degree. But I think this, the the process as was set up didn't help matters. I mean, you now have the gateway reviews. Uh, and I think you know the the city region deals in Scotland have learned from a from a degree to to the English sort of city city deals, but I do think right at the outset that was part of a problem about how you measure performance of the English city deals. There wasn't a kind of framework. Uh, now a government would say, well, it's up to a local area to do that, but we would argue it's quite problematic. Okay. Any other witnesses want to come in and make an observation on that? Yes, yeah, please. Um, just to build on those comments and just to address your question directly, I think the concerns are absolutely shared by small businesses and whether that's in relation to Glasgow or the other two operational city deals or even the three developing city region deals that we have in the pipeline, um, this isn't a, a Scottish phenomenon um, but I think there are big concerns about lack of transparency both at the development stage and at the implementation stage and also concerns about the lack of engagement with the private sector in a more inclusive, discursive manner. And I think if you've tried to piece together the puzzle of city region deals in Scotland, it's quite a challenge to, to gauge how much, where and why. And in, in trying to ask some of these questions or answer those questions, um, you're struck by just the scale. You know, we're looking at somewhere in the region of four to five billion pounds between 10 to 20 years, and um, we could see upwards of 30 to 40,000 new jobs. Um, so I'd just like to put on the record, I think it's it's a very timely inquiry by the committee and look forward to take part. Okay, now, I, I think the point was made, not every witness has to answer every question, so I'm not, 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 no one's catching my eye to, to, add, to add an answer to that. So Mr Simpson, do you want to follow up on any of that? Yeah. Um we, w we will be focusing on the, some of the detail of the individual deals in Scotland, so I don't, don't think that's the purpose today. However, um, uh, I think it was yourself, Mr. Dr. O'Brien, who made, made the point around scrutiny um, of, you know, and, 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 and what results, uh, what, what the bang for your buck is uh, on these deals. Um, in Scotland, of course, we have uh, a lot of money from the UK government, a lot of money from the Scottish government going into these deals. Um, so where, where is the scrut, where is the scrutiny? Who is, who is, who is actually looking uh, at the deals in Scotland? Well, particularly Glasgow, because that was the first that's up and running. Um, to see if we're getting value for money, if we're get, if you know, if we're getting what we're supposed to get out of them. Yeah, if I can come in, I think part of the challenge in, in England as well uh, has been the uh, the abolition of the Audit Commission to a degree, so the scrutiny of local government, the formal scrutiny. You've now got the National Audit Office undertaking a much more uh, a direct role in scrutinising local government in, in England and combined authorities and deals and city deals, and I think doing a, a really very good forensic sort of job there. I think they're, they're excellent in, to that degree. Um, but I think, again, it was that kind of hiatus period of, of, of a lot of change and sort of turmoil from 2010 onwards meant that things maybe fell, you know, between the sort of uh, cracks. I just, just would say as well, kind of deal making by its kind of nature feels and seems a quite opaque process and secret process, however you might kind of look at that. Uh, so I think by the very nature, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to get information on how things are going. And certainly we found that from a research perspective. We know the UK government did a stock take of English city deals, but trying to get access to that kind of information has been quite challenging for researchers. OK, uh, I'll take you in a second, Professor McClellan. Can I take Leslie Warren in first? Certainly. Um, I just wanted to ask that. Obviously, you were talking about financial impacts, but obviously there's huge equality impacts in the money and how it's been spent. Um, it was part of the creation of these deals that they would address community issues. Um, almost all of the deals kind of vaguely reference social impacts but I can't seem to find any detail as to who's going to benefit who's been involved at the stages certainly in the Glasgow deal which is now fully formed and um, we as an organization have not been part of any of the the work that's been underway and I'm not aware of any community groups that have been um, so that transparency is an issue for us because we can't then evaluate the impacts and who it will or won't benefit 
Um, obviously, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has a project just now engaging with local authorities and partners, and we welcome that. But it seems like this has just been thought of now, and these deals have obviously been in process for a few years now, and we would like to know more about what has happened within these deals, obviously understanding that it is quite a secret process in the early stages, but now that information should be released, it would be good to know if quality impact assessments have been done and how this money is going to be spent in relation to um, public sector quality duties. That's very helpful. Uh, Leslie Warren, I'll take Professor McClellan in, and then I'll open it out to some other witnesses. Um, I wanted uh, just a couple of things about how these uh, deals have evolved is I actually spent about 10 years on the board of the Glasgow Regeneration Alliance uh, a long time ago. It was always a deal between the city, uh, the government's agencies and so on that was actually conducted in private. So there's nothing different about the city deal in, in that regard in terms of how major resources flowed. I also think that uh, after local government regions were scrapped in Scotland, the capacities to make major investment decisions and in infrastructure at a local authority scale just really didn't exist. Uh, and that one of the things that uh, one might talk about when one is looking at metrics and going forward, there's a more acute understanding of how infrastructure might affect growth and productivity and why it's important in economic development than was in the mindset of city policymakers in Scotland for about 15 or 20 years. So there are pros as well as uh, uh, cons in this, uh, and some quite big cons maybe, but uh, I think the, uh, it's important to see the context these deals went into, which was pretty absent of major thinking about infrastructure at that kind of metropolitan scale. I do think in terms of who's watching this, well, part of the point was uh, for local authorities to have skin in the game and put their money in front end. So each local authority ought to be looking at where the progress is. The Glasgow Economic Commission is unusual in the UK that we are there to, uh, uh, have to watch my hats here, and uh, we are there to actually see how the deal's progressing. So we are actually scrutinising how it goes. Um, in addition to that, you might ask the question of, and I think this has been missing in the debate in Scotland and indeed in policy thinking in Scotland, is it's fine to look at each, ind each individual deal, but what are they adding up to as a set of system changes for the Scottish city system? Nobody's addressing that issue, in my view, and nobody's monitoring that aspect. In other words, at the Scotland level, we've not got to grips with what they all mean. Uh, I would agree with the point about scrutiny by uh, community has been, in my view, near absent in all of these deals. Uh, was it Christy and then Barry McCulloch? Yeah, I just wanted to reinforce the point that, that Leslie had made about equalities and, and um, the scrutiny of that, but also add, as we've put in our evidence, that um, there seems similarly to be an absence of environmental assessment. Now, um, before retiring and, and taking on my voluntary post with Transform Scotland, I, I worked for the City of Edinburgh Council and Lothian Regional Council for more years than I care to remember uh, in, in the field of transport. And certainly in the latter part of that period, it would be the norm that you would carry out an environmental assessment and an equalities assessment and also a financial assessment and various other ones on any given project. Um, so I would assume that, that in each of the city deals that would be the norm. But what doesn't seem to be kind of there is a reflection of the total impacts in equalities or in the environment. And it might not be the case that if you take project A and project B in any individual deal, that the sum of that is A plus B. It may well be A plus B plus C. So that appears to be missing, even though notionally one would expect to see the impact assessments coming through on individual projects that form part of each deal. Hey, Barry McCulloch? I don't think there's any doubt that the governance arrangements that have emerged have been focused on robustness and adequate scrutiny, but the focus has been on partnership working within 
the deals and the focus has been on facilitating partnership working among local authorities. So they're not they're not looking out, um, and there's very little opportunity for external stakeholders like small businesses to contribute. And you know you do have assurance frameworks and um, gateway reviews and and a whole raft of terminology to describe the the world of of city region deals. Um, but I think it is important to to make the point that. And, you know, despite the commitment both by the Scottish government and the UK government, there, there's very little detail at a Scottish level that shows a dashboard approach. You know, where are we uh, with the projects? Because to take the, the Glasgow City Region deal as, as one example, you have a, a very good website that gives you information on the 20 plus projects. But the scrutiny of those projects is on Glasgow City Council site. Now, that seems like a obscure point, but if you're trying to get information both on the deals and the scrutiny of the deals, and one would imagine that those would be in one accessible place so communities and business owners could scrutinise those proposals. Graham Simpson, what do you want to follow up on any of that? Well, there's, uh, there's so much there, Convener. Fa fa fascinating. Um, it, so if we go back to uh, what, what you start off saying, uh, Professor uh, McLennan, you talked about um, that none of the deals have identified the infrastructure required. Um, so one of the criticisms of the, sorry to focus on the Glasgow deal, but it is the most advanced in, in Scotland. One of the criticisms of that um, is that just a whole load of money was thrown at this. Um, it wasn't actually a deal. It was, here's the money, off you go and spend it. Uh, and so um, council officers and the various authorities would were, were frankly salivating at this uh, pot of cash took projects that they hadn't been able to deliver for sometimes decades, dusted them off, popped them into into the deal and uh, off they go. Um, and, but, they, uh, but they didn't actually identify, as you said, what was, what was required. Is that a fair criticism? Um, I said that I thought... Sorry. Apologies, I'm going to indulge as chair. Can, can I give a really helpful question, Mr. Simpson? I'll, I'll come to you in a second. Just given the fact you were obviously involved in the Glasgow deal, my history is I used to be a regional MSP for Glasgow Region, mm. and the Graham Simpson MSP makes a very good point. You'll know that you'll know the specific case I'm about just to raise as a case study example of that, and that is when I was a regional MSP for Glasgow, the Kafkin Relief Road completion was suggested as one of the projects huge, massive local opposition to it. Uh, didn't think it would necessarily mitigate some of the travel issues. Public transport was the big issue in that local area rather than completing that link. Um, the cost, I just checked there, was eventually £18.6 million for that. Yet a stag report as recently as 2007 put the cost of doing that road at £3 million. So the local community thought, hugely expensive, undesirable, unwanted, not value for money. And that was one of the first Glasgow City deal projects. It got no community buy-in from the very early stages. So that road exists now. It's there. It's open. It's, it's just about Mr Simpson's point, but also how we learn from these experiences because there's city and region deals rolling out right across the country now. So rather than lambasting Glasgow City region, me personally, for that specific ill-considered road, in my opinion, how do we learn the lessons from that to make sure these things don't happen again? Sorry, Mr Simpson, that was, I saw that as my opportunity to put some of that on the record. Uh, Professor McClellan. OK. Um, well, I think that uh, I'd reinforce some of the, the points Pete made earlier about the importance of uh, uh, having good monitoring systems and so on in place. Um, how we got... The, what I actually said was I thought in the assessments that had been made that transport investments came up uh, in terms of the cost-benefit analysis and prioritisation as top of the list on city deals across the whole of the UK. And it relates to the methodology of whereby consultants and experts are able to give a big number for a transport project. Usually it's the saved value of travel time that they can't do for other projects. So there's a bias towards doing things in transport. And my point was... Uh, we also have an inheritance whereby, frankly, at the city and city region level, there was not the capacity to do that modelling, nor understand it. In other words, 
uh, you rely on external advisors and consultants to tell you what the answer is. And they do their job, but every place gets pretty much the same answer. Uh, and it's not the right answer in terms of uh, uh, looking at the needs of uh, infrastructure for business, uh, infrastructure for innovation areas or whatever within cities. So that, that was my point. I thought that it was weak analytically from the get-go. Um, I actually do more work in Vancouver and Sydney than I do in Glasgow. That depends who pays for the research funds these days. Uh, and I've just been involved in developing the city strategy for uh, the Sydney metropolitan area. And the capacity of a city region like that to do this kind of modelling, to have the debate, to involve communities, to involve the Committee for Sydney, which is all about business in the process, is a good demonstration to look at about how you would do what is a major investment strategy going forward for the metropolitan area. So I think we can learn from the experiences we've had, but we can also learn from other places that actually do it much smarter than we do. Uh, we didn't put enough thought into, nor enough resource uh, into, well, we're, we're, we're trying to do all this at a point when the kinds of people that do that thing within local authorities have been retiring early for the last 20 years. There's hardly anyone left that could actually do this work when it came. So when the billion pounds arrived in Glasgow, there wouldn't have been that many people who knew what to do with it. That was obvious. Mm. I'm deliberately leaving that one hanging there, Professor McClellan. But I'm not sure if we can go back to Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Christy wanted to come in. Um, yeah. Might be a friend to people like me, actually. Um, I, I, I was just kind of picking up the, the point that's being made about, about Glasgow and how that deal seems to have come together. I would actually suggest that by the time you come to the more recent deals, the pendulum swung the other way. If you look at the Edinburgh one, simply because it's the most recent one, um, and you look at the components of that deal within transport, I'm, I'm not arguing the point about the split of transport as opposed to housing and other projects that, that form part of that deal, transport actually forms quite a small part of the funding of that deal so far. And if you look at the individual projects, which off the top of my head I can only think of two, <coughs> certainly one of them, which accounts for six times the amount of spending of the other one, um, I cannot see how that particular project relates to the, or I have some difficulty, shall I say, turn it down a bit, uh, relates to the general thrust of the council's policies um specifically what's being talked about is spending 120 million pounds on um grade separating sheriff or roundabout as opposed to 20 million pounds which appears to be largely spent on studies into uh, sustainable transport in west edinburgh now if you were to look at the local transport strategies and the priorities of the councils that are part of that deal it does seem strange to me that Sheriff Hall Roundabout is the big mega project within that context. Um, so, I mean, wh where has that come from? That's part of the difficulty, and again, it's being touched on by, by, by the other panellists, but it's also, also part of our evidence. How on earth do some of these decisions, how are some of these decisions reached? If you look at what the, if you like, the strategic priorities of, the, of their partners are. Barry McCulloch, do you want to follow? Yes, please. Um, so the, the aim of city region deals is to boost regional competitive, competitiveness. Now, the question is whether or not they're on track to deliver that growth. And the truth is we, we don't know and, and we can hide behind phrases like it's, it's too early to tell. And, and, and it is, by the way, it is too early to tell. Um, but I think if you step back from it and look at some reviews that have been conducted in England by the National Audit Office that highlighted major problems and deficiencies within the method within the methodology and the approach and that highlighted just a few problems I'd, I'd like to cover. Um, firstly, difficulties in discounting, discounting displacement. So within Scotland, you know, if, if Edinburgh goes massively through the city region deal, is that at the expense of Glasgow or Stirling? Is it additional? Um, secondly, the lack of capacity and expertise to monitor, appraise and evaluate the programmes. That's back to the, the point that Duncan made. And lastly, different deals using different methodologies. So you can't, at the end of the day, step back and say, um, because of X money, we delivered Y jobs. Because in this case, jobs are being measured 
and implemented in quite different ways. And that will prove a challenge for both the Scottish Government and the UK Government um, to make you know, quite grand claims about city region deals because the I think the, the claims that have been made have been um, quite inflated. You know, they're indicative of the, the deal-making nature of the deals where local authorities are trying to lever more from central government. Um, but, but from an outsider's perspective, you know, all that does is heighten expectation that it will have a transform transformative impact. Thank you, Dr O'Brien. I just want to pick up the point about um, kind of modelling and, and in a sense at a, a UK context, the Office for Budget Responsibility, some of the research we did speaking with local areas had suggested that it was very difficult for them to prove that city deals would generate additional economic growth and additional jobs because the OBR's kind of model had kind of almost factored in this would be the way in which the UK econ economy was going to grow. And this was about displacement. It wasn't about additional kind of growth. And so local areas came up against this kind of central or UK government uh, response, which was the model says this, you're then advocating that. We're not quite convinced that you that that's going to work. And that's been part of the challenge, I think, for even places like Greater Manchester, seen as a bit of the poster child for city region working in, in the UK, to convince and persuade Treasury, OBR and others that actually you can generate additional growth at a local level above and beyond what you think the national uh, forecasts are saying. So I think that's been part of the, the issue in England and, and it may be the case in Scotland as well. Really interesting. Do you want to come back and sum it up, Mr Simpson? Convener, I'd love to. I could and I, I, I could ask questions all day, but it's, it's important Simpson. that yep. other members okay. have a Andrew chance. Leitner. Uh, thanks very much, um, Convener. I mean, obviously, we're just at the beginning of this in, in, in inquiry, but um, the, the fact that these deals run for quite a long time means that governance is very, very important. Um, the English deals had a degree of um, governance reform in them, as I understand them. So it was almost like government was saying, here's some additional funds, but here as well are some additional powers you, you have. Now, it seems to me that we have or have had in recent years in Scotland regional spatial planning. We have local government's got fiscal powers. Local government has got very embedded frameworks for equalities and environmental and economic assessments. It's got governance and transparency arrangements and all the rest of it. So it seems to me quite surprising that we would attempt to do regional economic development through such an opaque process as this deal-making, particularly when um, the displacement effects that have been uh, intimated um, do appear, and my colleague Jenny Galruth may say more on, on this, uh, do appear to be uh, a risk in the Edinburgh city deal. Edinburgh, although I represent Lothian, perhaps will be criticised for saying this, doesn't really need the kind of growth that's envisaged, whereas um, areas like Fife desperately do. These are post-industrial areas. Um, I don't want to see thousands more commuters pouring into Edinburgh every day. That presents massive problems for Edinburgh. Um, and if we build new roundabouts, that's precisely what will happen. So I suppose my question is, should we even be taking this very much further or should we be strengthening the existing governance arrangements exist in local government, their capacity to work together and the existing powers that they have over money and over planning to do precisely what city region deals want to do in policy terms, but do it in a way that is more transparent, upfront, more consultative, and more sustainable over the time, type of timescales that are being talked about. Mr. McClellan, yeah. Um, Andy, I'm, I'm not sure if I agree with you on uh, all of that. Uh, I think there's a fundamental problem for growing metropolitan areas uh, that the consequences of economic growth, whether it's uh, shortages of transport infrastructure within the metropolitan system or shortages of affordable housing, um, they remain within that metropolitan area, whereas the tax revenues that accrue from the growth grow somewhere else. Some of them may now come here, uh, but mostly they went to Westminster, they didn't go to the local authorities. You therefore are reliant on national governments or federal governments having coherent reallocation programmes back for public investment and housing. Now, it'd be really difficult to say that the UK government had that position for the last 10 or 15 years. So that 
the problem we deal with in managing metropolitan regions effectively is one of really acute vertical fiscal imbalance in relation to what we're now asking them to do. So in the absence of greater tax resource powers or assignment of tax revenues to these metropolitan areas, we do need a way of transferring resource back. Transferring it back within a government structure that is a city, functioning city region rather than individual local authorities to me makes good sense given the nature of labour markets and housing markets. The city region's a reasonable entity, although we do have to look at environment and social as well as, uh, as the economic. So I think the, the governance issues there are, and what I think the, the Scottish Government confronts as an issue is how does it deal with city regions? How does it deal with areas outside of city regions? Because and if it neglects other areas, then that's not, uh, not very effective. But I also think there's a real difficulty in Scotland that we've intruded the geography of the city regions into a geography that's got health boards, uh, it's got uh, uh, regional uh, uh, infrastructure hubs, it's got other quango boundaries, and none of them match. So I think that uh, tidying up the governance structure uh, is actually, in quite simple ways, uh, would actually help bring these things together and give Scottish Government a clearer focus on how all these things come together at the one, one scale. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder if perhaps the issue here, we've never quite resolved the issues arising out of the last reorganisation of local government. Um, I mean, at, at that time, there was a regional layer, and the regional layer would take on many of the kind of projects that you see featuring in the city deals. You know, the bypasses, the railway stations, the railway reopenings. Those were carried out by regional, regional councils. Now, of course, obviously, we have the Scottish Government. We have kind of local councils. So I'm not saying there's an argument for introducing yet another layer of local government. Perish the thought. Um, but there seems to be a gap, which I think Duncan's perhaps getting at, somewhere between the local council level and uh, the Scottish Government. How you resolve that, I don't know. What it seems to be happening at the moment is that a lot of joint boards, joint committees are being kind of set up, partnerships and so on. Now, in terms of the democratic accountability of them, there's very little because the appointments are made by local authorities and government. They're not directly elected. Uh, it's the issue fundamentally about quangos, which I think you probably rehearsed quite well already. Any comments on that, Barry McCullough? I think there's a, a middle ground to be struck between city region deals, which do represent significant capital investment, and the existing function of local government to support economic growth and the regional and national bodies that also support um, local and, and national growth. Uh, I just think that it, it can be quite complicated and duplicative and what we're not standing back from that and going, how do we how do we make Scotland a more competitive place? And I think that despite the plethora of, of strategies, um, there's, there is a point for me that the deals are probably more about cities than about city regions and where is the impact on consequent local economies. Um, I, I think I have some big issues about how the um, whether the Ayrshires or the Lanarkshires or the post-industrial places, you know, what is what what will change for them within city deals? You know, there's a there's a good argument um, about agglomeration economics and the making cities great, but Scotland is a, a community of towns, 479 towns, uh, and and what about our towns? What about our regeneration efforts here? And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we do spend over £2 billion pounds a year on our enterprise and skills network and local government already has a key role to play you know, through Business Gateway and other functions in supporting business. Very helpful. A couple more responses from our witness. So Dr O'Brien followed by Professor McClellan. I just think uh, Mr Whiteman makes a very important point about governance of, of, of these particular initiatives and that's something that's come through our, uh, our research. You know, if you think about this in the context of England, um, a very centralised country and a big question about how England is governed and the rest of England's relationship to London, for example. These are where some of these questions of city deals have arisen. So from a UK government perspective, governance was part of the quid pro quo. You would get this particular investment if you as a group of local authorities agreed to set up combined authorities, 
uh, even now we have metropolitan mayors. So today, the seven metro mayors in England are meeting for the first time. You know, so it gives you a sense of the kind of where this might potentially be, be heading. But it's also coming up against a particular set of challenges in England. You know, so I know Yorkshire very well, doing some work there. Very problematic to try and agree the next stage of city deals through devolution deals, metropolitan mayors in a county like, like that. But it's, we, we would argue these are seen not only as economic development instruments, but they are governance reforms as well. And in the context of England, that's been quite clear. Yeah, Professor McClellan. Uh, two points. One, uh, one, going back to governance, the, the point that was made about uh, this sits slightly awkwardly between government and quangos and, uh, and the like. Uh, I've always been quite surprised in the context of the parliament where we have regional list members of parliament that there isn't an active regional scale role for these members. And it might well be that in relation to overseeing uh, city deals or how, uh, Quang in other words, to have a democratic uh, uh, presence in, in that context uh, might actually uh, make, make uh, uh, some sense. Um, the second thing I wanted to say was that uh, it's right about Scotland being in some sense, a country of towns as much as uh, cities. Uh, and if you look at the National Spatial Planning Framework, which has been, coach and horses have been ridden through that by the city deals, if you look at the National Spatial Planning Framework, it's very much a, a framework that's written from the Scotland of towns and, and regions. I think cities get mentioned on page 64. So that uh, the feel of how Scotland is as a place is actually quite accurate in, in that. What we do not have sitting beside the city deals yet is a coherent sense. I've, I've always railed against the notion that you treat city and town and rural as if they're cuts and you don't see them as connected. They're connected and supportive. Uh, and I think that uh, if city deals go forward without coherent town deals uh, across most of Scotland and not just the towns that have been missed out by the classification of the city regions like North Ayrshire, then we'll be missing an important trick in terms of looking at ways to take forward investment projects in, in some of the uh, smaller towns as well. Okay, thank you. Leslie Warren? Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that point there about um, governance. It, it feels from our perspective that there's a, a disconnect between the city deals and what's happening at sort of a national and local level in terms of addressing equality issues. We have the Race Equality Framework, for example, which looks at how racism should be tackled and institutional racism should be tackled across every policy making. It should be across all public bodies. We have the public sector equality duties, which put very strict reporting regulations on what local authorities, for example, should be reporting on and what they should be considering as evidence and involvement. But we don't see any of that fed into the city deals. We don't see any of these higher level um, drives being fed into how these deals are operating. Um, we mentioned before, obviously, that there's been no engagement with communities, but we would go further in that and say that we know of communities that have tried to approach their local city deal groups and just come across a brick wall. That's very helpful. Um, Andy Whiteman, do you want to follow up on some of that? I'll leave there just now. Okay, uh, yep. it leads on nicely to some of Jenny Goldust's lines of question, I suspect. Jenny Goldust. Yep. Thank you, convener, uh, and good afternoon to the panel. Um, I really want to go back to what Barry McCulloch was saying in terms of the deals originally being about the cities, uh, more so than the city regions, and I represent um, a couple of those towns that we, you've talked about um, this morning, this afternoon. Um, in the submission, Professor McLean, um, you state that the multiple local authority arrangements are compelled by a focus on city deals to target investments and policies to reflect, as far as possible, functional geographic areas rather than be bound by administrative areas. So um, in the Fife context, what the decision that's been made is that North East Fife has been cut and taken with the Tay Cities deal and the rest of Fife has been lumped in with Edinburgh. I believe to the detriment of my constituency, which takes in Glenrothes and Leaven, two areas of really high unemployment and child poverty levels. And in the submission, in Barry McCulloch, in your submission, you say if Inverness grows as a result of investment from the city deal, for example, how will this benefit firms and citizens in Fort William? So from my perspective as a constituency MSP in Glenrothes and, and in Leaven, 
I feel that the Edinburgh City deal has been a great boon for the city and to the detriment of my constituents. I can't point to a single uh, local project that you know I benefited from in the constituency itself. Um, and so therefore I wonder, is there a tension between the aspirations of the UK government in terms of their focus, which was on growth uh, and whereas contrasting that, I suppose, with the Scottish government's uh, ambitions, which are around inclusive growth. Inclusive growth, to me, is about also looking at issues of equity, and, and that was part of the deal originally. That was meant to be part of the consideration. And it seems to me that we've fallen through the cracks of two city deals and have actually been missed out. I don't know if the panel has any views on that. I suspect they might. <laughs> uh, uh, Professor McClellan, we'll start with yeah. yourself. I should admit, I also work at the University of St Andrews, so I go through your constituency quite often. Um, and I do I think that actually Fife is a very good example of uh, uh, an important uh, level of government that's been split by uh, different, uh, different city deals. Uh, and I, I, I would take that on board. Um, I think that um, when you are actually looking at how... Uh, it, if the objective, as Barry says, is competitiveness around the world uh, for major metropolitan areas, you deal with the metropolitan region. That's where the labour market flows go. That's where you have to think about some of the big environmental issues as well as uh, 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 some of the areas about housing and so on. So I, I would defend the notion of city region, but you have to be careful about how you ground it. And if there are exceptional areas that lie between it, you don't just draw a line, you think about how we do that. That gets slightly more complicated in the Scottish case because we've been talking about cities. Uh, if I was having this discussion in uh, Australia or Canada, there's only two of the Scottish cities that would be classed as being cities. They are the terrain of the agglomeration economies, the growth drivers, the large scale, i.e., what do you do about the core metropolitan areas of Glasgow and Edinburgh? Now, that's not to say you disregard the rest, but you have to think about them differently because the growth strategy you'd have for the uh, Perth Tayside uh, proposition or Aberdeen is different in terms of global connectivity, in terms of the way these places connect into the economy. So at Scotland level, we're not really being very direct. I he hear people talking about agglomeration economies in Perth and Stirling, and I think, good luck if you can find any, let me know, uh, because I, I haven't seen any evidence of them. And I don't think people will find any evidence of them. That said, in the Scottish context, given the geographic structure of our, our big towns, uh, I think it's then really important to think about how you deal, obviously, with Stirling, but also Falkirk, or Paisley as well, well, Paisley we're dealing with. So that I do think we need to be a bit more subtle about how we make these arguments and don't see all these city regions as the same thing. In terms of uh, the impact of the projects within the context of Fife, I think that gets back to the point that if once you have inclusive growth on the agenda, these initial city deals were not designed, in my view, to deliver inclusive growth. They were there to raise GVA per capita, not inclusive growth. Uh, but the capacity to remake them, and I think that uh, city deals should be seen. They're only actually a relatively small part of overall capital investment, after all. Uh, I think there's a case for realigning them within the context of uh, spending within these areas. In other, uh, Barry McCulloch, yes. I think that there's a definite tension between growth as traditionally conceived in GDP and GVA terms, just as, as Duncan had mentioned in, in the question illustrated, and inclusive growth. And you know, I've heard many city region deals talk about retrofitting. their deals to try and discover how they can make their deal more inclusive. Um, now, the fact that that has to happen is, is disappointing. Um, but I think the, the aspect of inclusive growth that, that I would focus on is this regional cohesion uh, argument. And that is, you know, to move away from just focusing purely on cities as a policy instrument and start talking about our towns and rural areas and what they need. Because if you go back to research that the FSB published in, in February, the most enterprising places in Scotland, you know, it, were, it, it wasn't the places that we thought it would be. It was Newton Moore, it was Ullapool, it was very small rural towns who have a strong history of entrepreneurship, but that wasn't being captured in conventional discussions about economic growth and, and I think there's a there's a missed opportunity there to 
to do much more for the hinterlands and, and to do that I think you focus on digital infrastructure I think that's that's the game changer and specifically mobile phone infrastructure I think the, the beauty of city region deals is you bring together the Scottish government, the UK government and, and local authorities and, and that's that's quite a unique settlement in a lot of ways and we can get over some of the disputes about reserve powers and devolved powers and if only we could increase the amount of people who could access 4G so at the moment according to, to Ofcom only 12% of Scotland's landmass has access to 4G. You know, there's still many, many business owners who are operating with very poor 2G. You know, that that is where the transformation lies. I think that's where we get the productivity and growth. Any other comments on that from witnesses? Do you want to come back, Jenny? Just to go back, um, uh, Lizzie Warren, to your submission, you talked about the lack of communication between communities, and, and I would agree in terms of my own experiences that it doesn't feel that the local communities I represent were at all involved in any consultation. Um, and I think as well, linking into uh, Christy, your submission, on the final page of your submission, you say the deal should provide significant opportunities to investment in sustainable transport. However, without a commitment to include sustainable transport uh, or for to have proper regard to national objectives for carbon emissions reduction, there are no mechanisms to ensure that sustainable infrastructure is prioritised. I think, Christy, you may be aware of the Leaving Mouth Rail Link campaign in my own constituency. And the, the opportunities, obviously, that offers in terms of what Professor McLennan alluded to with regard to connecting towns to cities in terms of uh, job opportunities, for example. The area I represent is completely cut off in terms of rail link. Uh, and so I just wonder then, is there an opportunity there to go back and revisit, as, as I think Barry McCulloch alluded to there, the opportunities for smaller communities, such as those I represent, the towns, um, the smaller communities, which are you know, I think to some extent disproportionately disadvantaged in terms of unemployment statistics and child poverty, for example. Who'd like to come in on that first? Yeah, just to pick up on Leaving, yes. I mean, that was quite strange, I think. Yeah. Um, regardless of, of, you know, the, the, I, I, I know the Scottish Government has now committed to do some, I believe, the some uh, initial, initial work on that. So a lot has to be done in terms of analysing the returns from that, that potential investment. But one would have thought, as a partner in the deal, Fife Council would be, you know, because as was touched on earlier on, this is a deal-making process. They would be hammering on the door saying, look, we have, and I can think of a couple of other projects in Fife that, you know, might have, might have gone into the, into the deal that would have made it more from, as a sustainable transport organisation, you would expect us to say, make it more sustainable. Uh, um, and it and it it's not. I mean, the, the difficulty seems to be that it's. Um, I mean, I retired in September uh, 2016, so um, I quickly say I was not involved in preparing the Edinburgh City Re Region deal, but I was part of the organisation um, that was. So I had some slight, you know, kind of insight, informal insight, and in, in what was happening. Uh, uh, and my observation was that it was quite opaque, not just to the outside world, but to some of the people you would expect to be part of the decision-making process. Um, I mean, again, I would just say what I said earlier, you know, reinforce what I said earlier. If you look at the outcomes of the city deal in terms of, bang, what's going down on the ground, it does seem quite strange. <laughs> Any other witnesses like to on that? Lisa Warren. Um, yeah, certainly from a community perspective, I, I don't see any reason why communities shouldn't be involved. I don't, I don't see any barriers to their involvement. Um, obviously, with some of the high-level negotiations, it's not necessarily appropriate for certain types of involvement or consultation. But the way they are now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see any reason for that not to be the case. Um, obviously, the constituent members of most of these city deals are public bodies, which have to comply with public sector quality duties. Um, but even within the individual bodies, we're not seeing a transparent narrative on what they've done. So, for example, in the local authorities' own public sector duty reports, we've not seen exactly how communities have been involved, exactly the engagement that they've included. And we would expect that to be part of their legal duties that currently exist, let alone, obviously, the bigger deals themselves. Um, I mean, from our perspective, it's, it's very much a two-edged sword because these deals, with the money that's behind them, there's real potential to address the equality issues that we're all aware of and under representation of certain groups in, in areas. But at the same time, without transparency, without positive action, without community involvement, there could also be regression. Um, we also saw in the, the press just last week, there was um, reports saying that the Edinburgh City deal was going to just remain the status quo 
obviously there's potential for that actually to, to further entrench um, disparities and disadvantages. Uh, Dr O'Brien. Just um, very briefly, I think to some degree some of the city deals in England feel quite dated now uh, in, in a sense of you know, the 23rd of June last year, a lot changed in the UK in the context of Brexit, and in particular, UK government talking about industrial strategy. So many city regions and places in England are thinking about their role within industrial sort of strategy and thinking about the whole concept of value, whether it was you know simply economic value, which was driving the city deals, financial value, because what's the return on investment in infrastructure, to now a question of actually what about the social and the environmental value, and what about those places that have really have been left behind, uh, and you know the consequences of that, and what happened at, at the sort of referendum uh, last year. So, to me, it seems it's quite sort of dated. And this kind of is the tension between these long uh, running programmes of 25 and 30 years, but in England, the context of where we continually sweep away and change from between the regional level to the city regional level and local level, and then come back again. And one suspects that that's going to continue. That's the thing that's bedeviled, I think, economic development in England and probably has across the, the UK. So there are a number of tensions, but they do feel quite sort of dated in England, thinking about, you know, people are now saying about what about industrial strategy? What about, you know, the role of the state in, in these kind of issues? Any additional comments? Barry McCullough? I think that's a, that's a really important point because there's just some misunderstanding about city region deals that they're somehow set in stone. Um, and that the 1.1 billion in Glasgow, for example, has been spent, and that's, that's just not the case. You know, you get funding in five year increments. Projects that have been promised have to go through a very thorough gateway review, and projects that don't stand up and, and don't deliver additional impact will not go through. And I think that fluidity creates opportunities, and I, think, I, I, I predict that there will be local authorities who are looking afresh at city region deals um, in light of changing political administrations and just seeing what their longer term commitment should be. Because in some ways, it's becoming a default way to develop to develop the economy, and if it's going to suck up a lot of resource, both human resource and capital inf infrastructure spend, then it's important that we maximise that spending, you know, whether that's in relation to procurement and making sure that smaller businesses win as many contracts as possible, or targeting the spend in more disadvantaged areas. Professor McLennan? I think if you look over uh, a long period of time, uh, 20, 30 years, um, even going back to the 1970s, we spent a huge amount in urban regeneration in Scotland, and actually done it quite well uh, at times. Uh, but we've been much better at uh, thinking about how we change neighbourhoods than we have about how we change broader metropolitan economies. We've actually dealt better, if, in my view, with some of the housing issues than we have in the economic development issues. And I think that the important thing in uh, some of the city deals was it was actually throwing this focus on GVA growth into the uh, uh, policy debate now, I think that it's then wrong to ignore these wider environmental and social uh, issues, particularly uh, as uh, members have stressed the importance of inclusive growth. Mo most people are signed up to inclusive growth. Uh, unfortunately, I find nobody can tell me what they actually mean by inclusive growth. And I think that what is beholden uh, in, in, the, in this discussion for cities and groups to react to is actually for there to be real clarity on the part of Scottish level of government and, local, and the city regions about what they're defining as inclusive growth. You, you can have lots of different versions of it, some, many of which are actually very good, but you have to be clear if you're then going to move on down into to discuss how you connect these infrastructure investment projects to the social outcomes that uh, Jenny Gilruth was looking for. And I actually think there's a lack of clarity in Scottish Government strategy here. I, th I think they're on the right message, but actually articulating what does this actually mean and how can these uh, more local entities, whether it's city regions or local authorities or towns, how can they react to that? I, th I think that that's a real problem. Okay, um, I might just move on just now, just for the purpose of time. Jenny, anything additional you want to add? I know Kenny Gibson had a couple of supplementaries. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. Can we appreciate that? I mean, I think on the issue of inclusive growth, I mean, it basically in shorthand is each and every community benefits from the overall growth in the economy. And I think a concern I have is absolutely 
uh, the same as Jenny Gilruth, I represent North Ayrshire, where and in Ayrshire the per capita income is 32% below the Scottish average, and there's a real concern that we're being left behind and an almost bewilderment with the size of the kind of uh, Edinburgh City deal, you know, in an area where there's already housing shortages, as we know, the, uh, the economy is overheating relative to other uh, parts of Scotland. And I think also there's a concern that the towns in North Ayrshire, Fife and elsewhere are effectively going to be dormitory towns where people move because the housing, frankly, is cheaper and then they've got to drive or or, 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 or uh, take the train or bus into, into work and, and or cycle or whatever. And that, of course puts um, um, bigger um, demands on the, the infrastructure that we've actually got. So the, the question I have is how do we ensure, I know we've touched on this already, that areas, some areas just do not miss out. And should, should there be an, an equalisation almost in terms of growth? Do you looking at the kind of... Um, the, the issue of areas like Ayrshire falling further behind in, a Scot in Scottish and UK terms so that additional funding goes into those areas to try and help them catch up with the... The, the Glasgow's and Edinburgh's in terms of GVA. Uh, Professor McLennan. I think um, sharing the objective of all areas gaining from growth in a, uh, in a nation like Scotland is uh, absolutely unexceptional. Um, how you apply it to a single specific you know, set of programmes is more difficult in that uh, if the ethos about Scotland's economic future is, uh, a part of it is the competitiveness of the major cities, because they can do certain things that other kind bits of the country can't do. Uh, whether that has to be shared through every project or whether, in a sense, it gets shared through the tax revenues that come from growth in a particular place, I think it's quite a, quite a tricky question. What, what, and I think that I would apply a less restrictive criterion, which would be that when you're undertaking a major investment project for growth reasons, you try and ensure as many of the benefits accrue locally as possible. And, but if they can't do that, then you have to rely on the tax system to redistribute it. I actually have read North Ayrshire's uh, uh, submissions. I've done some work with them in the past. And I think that they are a very good example uh, of a council trying to think about how to take a set of towns forward in a way that actually is thinking about these kind of deals, a, a set of town deals. And I was referring to it earlier. And I think in the Fife setting, you could equally uh, have a set of deals that would deal with some of the infrastructure restriction issues that relate to some of the growing areas, but also disadvantage in some of the others. So, in a sense, a necessary, to me, a necessary complement to the city deals approach, if we're going to have fair outcomes and, in, and growth and inclusion across Scotland, is we have to have much greater prominence to what happens in town strategies as well as city strategies. Now, I know that may be an odd thing for an urban economist to say, but if you look at how Scotland functions, I think it's really important that, that we think about that. Dr. O'Brien? Probably two points I'd maybe make in response to that. One would be some interesting work which is happening around the notion of foundational infrastructure and, uh, uh, and some work that Carol Williams, University of Manchester, has done. I mentioned about industrial strategy. There's a report being published today by University of Sheffield, University of Manchester, Industrial Strategy Commission, which talks about every place should have a, a, a basic minimum level of infrastructure, you know, and saying that actually the economists are now beginning to get their heads around that and see that's important. So that's quite interesting. I think the second point is those places that are more market-driven and more the economies are more probably more buoyant, and it's a big question in the UK, but particularly in England, around how you capture things like land value uplift and use that to reinvest back into infrastructure, maybe elsewhere. And that's highly difficult, highly problematic, but it's something that we've got to somehow get our heads around, one would suspect, you know, that we haven't done enough, for instance, in London, capturing the land value uplift from property and land that's been used to invest in Crossrail to then reinvest elsewhere. And I think we've got to somehow address the whole question about land value and tax uh, and redistribution. Thank you. Uh, Barry McCullough? Uh, uh, unquestionably, and just in, in light of that question, um, city region deals are the new game in town. And so we have three operational that have levered significant investment. You know, We have several in the pipeline and we have two growth deals that are also looking for external investment and local authorities being very 
tight on finance will obviously go where the money is. That that's that's only natural. But I think there's a the wider point about how you build resilient local economies outside of that because the approach is very city centric. And my own fear is that the businesses and citizens who are outside of that city region sphere will, will miss out unless we focus on maintain, maintaining the infrastructure that we have, that we're make, making sure that we're spending locally, that we're recruiting locally and we're building up. We're almost insulating the local economies from the external shocks that we know will happen. And this is all taken at a place at a time when the economy is in a, is in a difficult state where our business confidence is subdued. So it's really important that we maximise the economic impact from not just local authorities, but from all governments. I think there's a real issue about whether infrastructure should be, investment should go in areas that are doing well to make them grow even further, or should be in areas that are actually falling further behind in order for them to catch up. And obviously I would support the latter. But I would just, um, on a, a question to, to Professor Duncan McLennan, and it's basically on a, a gross value added. Um, I mean, I note, I note in the 12, the 12 city deals you've looked at, only one of which is, of course, is in Scotland at the moment, it's quite astonishing the difference in the new money. So to speak per capita, it ranges from, uh, well, it's Glasgow's the second highest in the, of, of the 12 looked at, £556 per capita, which looks really impressive, down to a woeful £3 per head in northeast of England, Sunderland and the black country. So I'm just wondering what makes those huge differentials, and, and Professor Brian might want to comment, uh, Dr uh, Brian might want to con comment on that as well, uh, why is there, what is the reason for those colossal kind of uh, differentials in terms of the, the deals that you've looked at? Uh, well, I think that um, actually Peter uh, probably knows more about the, the English set, setting than me, but our experience in comparing the English ones with uh, uh, Scotland or even within Scotland is it's the bespoke nature of the deal. Uh, there's no intention to have equality of per capita expenditure from place to place. It was the story that you told uh, 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 um, uh, Whitehall uh, or Westminster uh, and uh, uh, the, the funding bid that went with it. There wasn't any attempt at equality, which is why I think that seeing city deals as a basis for devolution in England is doomed from the outset. It's not going to serve uh, that purpose in any, any current fashion. So I, I think that uh, uh, there's no rationale for the per capita expenditures and, uh, and differences that I've seen. Uh, one of the other, and just touching on a point that was made about uh, the use of infrastructure to take gains, um, I was recently doing some work for the Prime Minister's office in Australia, and the Australian view in our, our city deals is interesting. Uh, they were that they were relatively small and unambitious, uh, but they can afford to have slightly bigger deals. And in Sydney, their city deal is about creating a third Sydney round about a new international airport. So they're at a different scale in terms of what they think this is about. They did comment that they found it really odd that given that one was using land and planning powers and infrastructure, there didn't seem to be any coherent commitment to extracting development gain out of the process to pay for the infrastructure. And I think that's true when you look across the Scottish city deals. Uh, there is no real thinking about the extent to which that can pay for the infrastructure rather than taxpayers. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, that's something that would be well worth looking at in the, in the, in the Scottish context. But in terms of variations in expenditure, I, I don't know of any rationale. Dr. Ryan, did you want to add in? Other, other than the, the, the table that we produced, which was very difficult to get any information from specifically around, around that, uh, sorry, the graph, I should say, was certainly uh, Cardiff and Cambridge and, and Manchester and Preston around transport infrastructure mm -hmm. in the main. Uh, but, but for Sunderland uh, and, and, and the black country, it was a sense of the UK government wanted to conclude, conclude deals quickly but, uh, but also a sense of either, you know, money had been committed elsewhere, uh, you know, and, and this is really three million for, well, sorry, the, the funding that Sunderland got was for um, preparatory work for the advanced manufacturing sort of park there, you know, but they were trying to be ambitious around tax increment, but weren't getting anywhere with Treasury. So it's, a, it's led, as we said, I think, in our submissions to this real disparity. Uh, and in particular, there are areas there like Sunderland and the Black Country and Stoke and Staffordshire really do need 
investment uh, in, in their local economies. But it then led to, leads to this kind of opaque sort of sense of, uh, and maybe some might say unfairness in the system as well. Okay, can we just, uh, Alexander, bring in a little second. We've got a couple of questions. Let me make sure we cover some questions. So, because we'll be asking these questions again in other evidence sessions, we want to make sure we've covered. Uh, so, future funding in relation to city deals, our understanding is conditional on specific outcomes. So, specific outcomes have to be met, but it's also a guarantee of long term funding, which then begs the question of those specific outcomes aren't met. Are those local authorities involved in the city region deals making alternative arrangements for the long term sustainability of the, the projects that have been started? We've, we've heard the word retrofit already mentioned here. Could retrofit be code for pull the plug on one scheme and uh, pop it into another scheme? So, uh, just some information around that would be quite helpful, your, your views around that. But also, I don't, I'm not quite clear what the outcomes that have to be met are. And already we've had some discussions around, well, how do you define what inclusive growth looks like? So is GVA eh, a relevant index to follow when looking at outcomes? We should be thinking better about how we monitor outcomes. So some general information around that would help us. We'll be asking those questions to witnesses in, in, in future deals. I don't know if there's any comments in relation to, to, to that question. Dr O'Brien. I think just on the first point, if I can come in on that, around um, the role of local authorities or, or groupings of city regions uh, in terms of um, making sure the investment is there to deliver on particular projects. Now, if these things are over 25, 30 years, they staged sort of payments in effect, it, it seems to me, from government, if you meet certain conditions and criteria. You wouldn't build a metro system over 25 well, one would hope you wouldn't, over 25 and 30 years, you would build it over a much shorter timescale. But the issue might be for a group of local authorities that they securitise, in effect, that income, borrow against it, and, and, and actually deliver that investment over, you know, five or, or, or sort of ten years, or hopefully five years. The question would be, if they don't meet certain conditions, then what's the issue then for that group of local authorities that may have borrowed that money up front uh, to invest in that? And I think that's the question, and that's part of the reason why some local authorities in England have been quite nervous about signing up to the success of city deals, devolution deals, because they're not quite sure whether you know they can meet those financial sort of uh, requirements. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments that is that relevant in Scotland in relation to that as well, Barry McCulloch? That's uh, the question you asked is almost impossible to to answer because of the lack of transparency. And certainly I'm waiting for the Audit Scotland and Accounts Commission work to provide greater scrutiny um, so that we can make an informed judgment because the, at, the, at the moment it would, be, it would be a relative stab in the dark as to whether or not the projects are on track to deliver growth. Uh, Professor yeah. McLennan. In the Glasgow context, um, there has been uh, a lot of discussion and some progress in trying to get uh, indicators to uh, suggest how progress goes forward. Uh, the role of the Commission was to scrutinise the projects that were there rather than to say what should be there, uh, or, although I think there's now a much more active debate about whether the Commission should be saying, well, this isn't really a very good thing to, you know, the indicators already might be showing something's problematic, maybe we should be thinking about something else. So uh, I think that that I don't want to comment further because I'd be getting into my commission remit. But I do think that that these are fair points. I think uh, one has tried uh, that there has been some progress. There needs to be more uh, a personal and a professional level. I do think the process needs to be much more transparent and much more in the public domain uh, than it actually is. That's helpful. Uh, thank you for that. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, and thank you, panel, for what has been a very interesting discussion so far. Uh, you know, we've touched on the frustrations, we've touched on the, the tensions that are, are, are happening across the piece. Uh, and from someone who, who represents Mid Scotland and Fife, I look at what my region has. You know, I have affluent areas, Perth and Kinross, Stirling, and I've got Clackmannan and Fife. So there's a, a real difference across that whole region that I look after. Uh, and there are various different deals being drawn up across these local authorities. Now, we've, we've touched on engagement. Now, Local authorities have been the mainstay or have had a, a massive impact in, in this process to date. Uh, academia has had its part to play, and so has communities and business to a lesser extent, it would appear. 
Uh, now, my, my focus should be that you know, when we're talking about the business community, and the business community have come back saying that the, there has been poor or no engagement, there has been poor or no uh, consultation, and there's little or no knowledge about what's happening here. There's been some discussion uh, in some of the uh, previous discussion we've had already, and also from the reports we've had about business champions uh, with being appointed or being part of that process. Uh, I'd like to try and expand a little bit on that side of it, uh, because you know, if we are going to have the economic growth that is talked about, and if we're going to have the investment that comes, then the business community has to be pioneering or has to be sector leading uh, and and I have got real some concerns that that's not the case across here uh, we can be uh, given opportunities and, and shown that yes in some areas there has been uh, a good engagement with an organization or a business uh, but there's not been that with the small business uh, which is the, the the mainframe that we have across most of our towns and cities uh, uh, that, that that generate uh, the employment, that generate uh, the economic development and and the potential for the future. So you know, I have got some real concerns about that. So I'd like the panel to just think about what that should be, and you know, if we are going in that direction, what we're trying to achieve, uh, because I think that already we're missing out. Uh, and small business, I believe, is missing out uh, in this whole process already uh, uh, from where we are. Any reflections on that? I suspect Barry McCulloch might want that to that answer that. that. Um, I think the, I share those concerns, but I think that City Region deals are, are here to stay. So we've committed to um, provide funding for at least a decade for two of the operational city deals and for 20 years for the Glasgow City Region deal. So the conversation we need to have now is, well, how do we make it work more effectively and, and set aside some of those concerns that this should have been tackled three years ago. Um, but I think one of, one of the ways in which you do that is you reflect on, on developments outside of, outside of city region deals. You know, we've got a whole culture of open, transparent decision making, whether that's through community empowerment um, or whether it's through participatory budgeting. Um, only this week we, we had that announcement from the Scottish Government in COSLA. We have business improvement districts and we have a good, you know, we are quite good at this in Scotland, but it seems that city region deals are insulated from those developments and I, I, I struggle to, to understand why. But, you know, you mentioned earlier that the there was an opportunity to, to improve through independent small business commissioners. You know, that was a, that's been an important part of, of our contribution to this debate. You know, Having an independent private sector voice on the deals, and you do have Opportunity North East in the Aberdeen City region, but they represent a particular segment um, of the economy, an important one, but I think there are questions to be asked about how representative their views are on smaller local businesses. And I think in, in addition to that, there's the, the role of the Small Business Commissioner to to scrutinise, which which is important, but also to explore the opportunities and to make sure that key spending decisions are being made with small businesses in mind. So whether that's in terms of um, procurement or public contracts, making sure you use Public Contract Scotland, which the Glasgow deal has done, but it's just promoting the opportunities because there are significant supply chain opportunities for the private sector to exploit. We just need to you know, be much more systematic in our approach to engaging businesses because at the moment it's quite piecemeal. You know, you may run an event in one area or a survey may be developed in, in, in Murray to encourage businesses to take part. But really what you need is a much more holistic approach so that the local community overall, whether that's the private sector or the third sector or citizens, can have an open debate about what should be taken forward. And, and I think that's that's the missing component. You know, transparency, openness, and just, just discussion. You know, what, what's best for the economy of Murray? Um, what's best for the economy of Stirling and Clack Manager? What should the money be spent on and how do we take that forward? I wonder if we could widen it out a little bit because I'm conscious we're not really talking about people in communities that much when we talk about inclusive growth. And one of the reasons that Leslie Warren were very keen for yourself to come along was in relation to that sustainable growth and what an equalities agenda looks like. So Barry McCulloch quite rightly is talking about a small business champion in relation to future engagement and, and how a city deal and region deal should develop going forward. Should there be an equalities champion? Is there a need for a much more strong engagement strategy in how city region deals do their business? If there is retrofitting going to happen to some of these deals, is there lessons to be learned? Is there some pointers you might want to give us in terms of how we can take that forward in a much more inclusive way for all our communities? 
Um, well, I think sort of, most of what Barry said sort of covers what we would agree with. We already have much of the legislation that's needed. Um, we already have the Community Empowerment Act, like you said. There's already duties on public sector, which I've mentioned several times. Um, and we do generally have a, a consultation environment when it comes to public spending and to local decision making. We're just not seeing that in city region deals. So it's perhaps not necessarily about introducing new schemes or new ideas or having one person whose job it is. Um, for example, the minister wrote to the HRC and encouraged that every city region deal work with the HRC because they recognise the importance of embedding these issues. I think our concern is just now, we just don't know where communities fit into this. There's not been transparency about what the decisions have been made, especially for some of the newer deals. So it's not clear to us where communities would fit into that um, because we would want to make sure that when they are included, <clears throat> it's not just tokenistic, that what they suggest, their views that are included are meaningful and it does have an impact. That's very helpful. Um, and, and I'm just wondering, um, in terms of that, do, do, do you have any suggestions that, that you would like to make and how how that can be, be improved upon? For example, when we talk about uh, inclusive growth, what, what would that mean to CRER? For example, I, I think about my constituency, which is very close to Glasgow City Centre, but it's one of the most deprived constituencies in Scotland, so it's Maryhill and Springburn. I would want to know how the city region deal benefits Postle Park or Royston, gets people economically active and gives added value to the economy of Glasgow and the city region, rather than just making a strong economy in parts of the city even stronger. So there's, even for someone whose constituency sits, with, sits at the heart, of a city region deal, I would have issues over what inclusive growth looks like. So what would inclusive growth mean to yourself? Because these are the questions we're going to have to tease out with some of the, the political leadership of city region deals going forward. Um, absolutely. Um, so from CRER's perspective, um, employment is obviously a key part of most of these deals. And they are looking at addressing um, the issues of social um, exclusion in many different areas. So we know, for example, within the BME community Scotland-wide, they are outperforming their white counterparts in education, but yet they are less likely to be in employment. And when they are in employment, we do tend to find a clustering in certain lower ranks and lower pay packets. So we would expect there to be measures within how this money is spent to tackle things like this. This is something that we've known for a long time. These are not new statistics. They've existed for a decade or more. We also know, for example, within BME candidates, when they go for applying for apprenticeships, for example, there's massive underrepresentation of BME applicants. That the same is seen for disability. And again, we would expect these deals to be a vehicle to address these issues. Um, it's, it's, it's a shame that there just isn't enough for us to look at, because if we even had the documentation of what they were currently doing, we could per perhaps have more of an involvement about positive actions and things. But I just I don't feel comfortable saying this is what we should be doing, because I just don't know what's currently happening. That's helpful. Alexander Stewart, do you want to follow up on any of that? And then once you do, I'll take maybe Andy Whiteman for the final line of questioning. Yeah, and, I, I thank, thank you, Convener. Uh, you know, you, you've identified many of the areas that are of major concern going forward, uh, and I think that, that that has to be uh, the case, that we, we need to try now and, and progress uh, these, these deals to ensure that we have the, the community engagement, that we have the uh, deprivation being talked about, not just the blue thinking that it's going to be the panacea that's going to sort everything in the community for the next couple of decades because it's not going to happen unless we have everybody making that contribution and feeling part and parcel of that uh, because it, po, po, what I can see at the moment with some of these deals is that there are real winners and there are real losers uh, and, and as we continue to investigate this it, it'll be important to see how that progresses so from that where should we be looking next at what is being achieved within these communities and these organisations because if we do not uh, get it right uh, then, as I say, individuals and organisations are going to uh, wither on the vine and, and, and communities are going to go backwards instead of going forward. So I think Leslie Wong's got some very good examples of the kind of things that you would like to see monitored. I'm just wondering if any other witnesses have got an idea of what they would like to see monitored in terms of outcomes uh, going forward with, with these deals. Professor McLennan? I, I spent a long time working on housing issues in... Uh, uh, Glasgow and I was on the board of Scottish Homes for 10 years and w I spent a lot of time two days a week as it happened going to uh, work with communities in Glasgow about 
mainly housing issues, but also in the West of Scotland more generally. And you could see that the energy that went into these things from communities really shifted places that uh, there are whole neighbourhoods still in Glasgow in particular that would have been about drugs and crime if, in a sense, communities hadn't been encouraged or enabled to actually take forward change. I have absolutely no doubt about that. What I think is surprising in this context across Scotland is, and thinking about how this would play in the other cities I work in, you would at the very least have a communities forum uh, to actually discuss these issues on a recurrent basis. You would have an annual communities conference to talk about progress as perceived by the community. Um, I, I will... Uh, in my academic capacity, write to the chairman of the Glasgow uh, Commission, uh, suggesting to him it might be a rather good idea if we did this uh, in, in the context of Glasgow and maybe the others might take it up. I, I think certainly community engagement of this kind is absolutely essential if these uh, uh, projects are to be taken forward and, as somebody said earlier, supported by the community and driven forward. Very, very helpful. Uh, Professor McLennan, Dr O'Brien, did you want to add in? A very brief fi uh, fi final point on this would be that in England, uh, a lot of the deals were capital intensive, capital heavy, and you can't divorce what was happening to local government revenue spending at the time, which was impacting very heavily upon local communities. So on the one hand, you were getting local authorities having to cut back on services in local communities, and yet at the same time, these deals were coming in were capital intensive. So th there, was a, there was an imbalance there. And I think that's really important going forward for the deals, the split between capital and revenue, because revenue tends to be much more important for sort of the local communities. OK, any additional comments before we move on? Uh, Barry McCullough. In terms of, of what happens next, I think it's really important that the city region deal teams get out and talk to not just businesses, but communities proactively. So not just on the basis of delivering a project, whether that's the improvements on Sockey Hall Street, but just trying to get people's views on how things are and how they can be improved, um, because there are moves elsewhere to do just that, and, and it works. And it's just about committing to something that's a bit more open and transparent. Um, but to make those judgments, we, we have to know what we know, um, and at the moment um, we don't. I think there's good practice in Scotland performs. I see no reason why you know, city region deals shouldn't aspire to, to a dashboard approach so that people can, at a glance, see the performance overall that city region deals are making. I think that's helpful. Uh, Christine, um, I'm afraid that question rather blindsided me, so I might be not entirely coherent, but I will be looking into areas such as Transport poverty for you will be probably seen the, 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 the work that was done by Sustrans, I think, was published last week on, you know, the issues around that. I think some of it's actually been already alluded to by members of your committee, you know, asking questions about, yeah, yes, Edinburgh is kind of, for example, Edinburgh is a prosperous, um, overheated economy. How do people who live in... Um, some of the less well-off communities that surround, surround that get access to that. And by that, I mean physical access. That's about transport. That's about things like, you know, public transport. How is it easy to get to places by public transport as opposed to getting in your car for if you're, if you're well-off and you live in East Lothian and whizzing around the bypass to, to get a nice, well-paid job in, in Edinburgh Park? It would be looking at issues like that. It would be looking at things like modal split and so on. So it would be those. I haven't actually got a kind of pre-set package for you of answers, but I'll get back to you if you want. We're just prodding away okay, to, right. to, to, to teasing some of this out. That, that's very helpful. Leslie Warren, final comment in this section, and then we'll move to Andy White with the final line of questioning. Leslie. Yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to summarise, because absolutely welcome the questions in terms of what can be done in terms to improve what it is that we've just been talking about. I think my nervousness of pointing out one, one silver bullet, um, for example, the comment there about um, a community forum and things, it's just from an equalities perspective, we've been working so hard to make sure that equalities are at the forefront of everyone's mindset, that it's not just you have an equality advisor and they deal with everything. This is huge sums of money. These are people in high ranking professions. Everyone should be looking at how equalities is part of their day to day working. And I think that that's what we would like to see is documentation of that in the first instance, as well as individual engagement, as well as working with communities, as well as wider Scotland initiatives. 
it was a mainstream everyday concern plus any form of communities conference would be welcome but it should be a mainstream everyday concern I think is the key point you're, you're making there yeah, yeah but that's helpful uh, Andy Whiteman uh, thanks, convener. Okay, so I'm, I'm still at the stage of trying to work out what this is all about and what we're trying to do. And I, when I look at the English experience, I see some logic to what the UK government was attempting to do in England. I don't see the logic in Scotland. As my understanding is the Scottish government's made no formal announcement that there shall be a programme of city deals. We've had a cities alliance, we've had a focus on city regions in the third national planning framework, but none of that is, 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 is matched up with the city region deals. July 2014 was the UK government's announcement that Glasgow would get a big lump of cash. I think Danny Alexander announced that. Within hours, the Scottish government matched that. This was in the lead-up to the Scottish independence referendum. Is it not the case that what's been happening in Scotland has been substantially on the back of a highly politicised process in 2014 where the story was the UK government's giving all this money to Glasgow, you don't need to be independent, the Scottish government's, oh, we'll match that, etc. So it was all quite hasty and taking place within quite a politicised environment. And the, what we're now dealing with is the aftermath of that and the fact that we don't want to be left out through not having city-region deals. But from a Scottish policy point of view, I'm still not clear what a city-region deal is. It doesn't seem to have any rational, logical underpinning like... The, I'm not saying the English city deals do have a rational, logical underpinning, but it's, you, you, it's, you, you're able to see what the government was trying to do. I don't see that in a Scottish context. So my question is, are we just playing catch-up here to what was, understandably, decisions made in a very highly politicised environment in 2014? Now, there's a question. Professor McLennan, do you want to start on that? I think to quote the kinks on this, in the field of urban policy, we are dedicated followers of fashion. There's no doubt about that. Um, I, I think these were distinctive uh, 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 political circumstances. That said, I think the Scottish Cities Alliance, which uh, I certainly was and am supportive of, to have a forum that brought together uh, the major chunks, if you like, of the uh, geography, the uh, population geography of Scotland together to discuss issues, but also the connections between them. And that interconnection was something that's been missing in, in the English context. The Scottish Cities Alliance was a good idea, but within it, the resource flows, it was running on, what, six, seven million pounds a year. So it was about catalytic ideas rather than investment in infrastructure. If you then flip that over, and recognising that the larger Scottish cities and the others are partly competitive with cities in England in terms of outputs uh, and in, in, in markets, uh, could you then argue that there was enough attention to strategic infrastructure investment in the Scottish city regions? And I, I think I would have been fairly confident in saying in 2014, well, no, there isn't. So actually something that deals, A, with a city region which actually, if you go back in uh, cities policy in Scotland to when there was the cities development grant, uh, they were allocated initially before the programme was downsized on the basis of a strategic city region statement. People have forgotten about this, but it, I only remember it because I was responsible for leading the review of Scotland <laughs> cities, so I remember it. Uh, there was actually a notion that city regions ought to have a strategic vision and, and work together. And that actually prevailed for about 18 months and then disappeared for various political reasons. So I do think that it's not all simply about fashion and politics. There was a genuine case for having a more coherent view about how infrastructure could support growth. And then we need the specific model of growth we're going to translate that into. So I would defend that as, uh, I think, a reasonable thing to do. Uh, I don't uh, think the process is, has gone on, uh, has actually met my initial objectives about what a good way to do an infrastructure strategy that connected to economy and society and environment is. That's not evolved. So we could actually do better but not lose the point about a coherent infrastructure strategy at these regional levels. Bring other witnesses in. 
Andy Whiteman because there might not be a chance to come back again. So I'm just giving you the opportunity if you get any additional reflections or questions to ask at this point and that can be mopped up by by the various witnesses because time's almost upon us. No? Oh, sorry, no, no. no right, I'm just okay. happy to... Right, so I, I, I think it was actually quite a helpful final question, uh, which I think was what it's actually all about. So what clarity over the intended purpose of it, but perhaps actually what do you think it should be all about might be quite helpful as well. So, final comments I suppose in relation to city region deals and where we are. Mr McCulloch, can we die contact at you first? There's a degree of comfort that I'm not the only one um, <laughs> in trying to make sense of this and I think for about 18 to 24 months you know that's what we've been trying to do at the FSB and I think the position we've arrived at is that it's a payment by results model where the Scottish government and the UK government provide funding for the projects that they want to deliver you know it hasn't really brought the UK and Scottish government together on a, on a program of works to upgrade infrastructure or deliver a, a skilled workforce I think the intentions are are sound but it just ha it hasn't quite worked out that way and I think what's happened is that we've spent a lot of time building up that apparatus and structure and we're servicing the governance arrangements and I think we're forgetting about what is the actual purpose of the city region deals which ultimately is about jobs and growth and we can argue about what that growth should look like but I think that's that's the focus and, um, and just one final point that, that I would make is that you know they, they are here to stay and we have to look at practical approaches to make it work you know one particular um, thing that I would recommend is it's not only greater scrutiny by, by this parliament on a regular basis um, to make sure that the city deals are, are delivering, but looking at how we can make it easier to do business across city regions. And that, that isn't a point about deregulation, but a point about better regulation. So one example that I would give is that if you're a, a window cleaner operating in the Glasgow city region, you will have to have eight window cleaning licenses. Um, you know, for me, I think there's an opportunity to streamline that process and make it online and simple so that you can apply to one place and clean windows throughout. So really looking at the connection of municipal boundaries and economic geographies and just having a serious look at what we can do to make it easier and more more efficient to do business. Yeah, thank you. Any other final comments from other witnesses? Leslie Warren. Um, I think from our perspective, we would like the city deals to be a real opportunity. As we've mentioned a few times in the panel, there's, there's generally a positive attitude towards equalities in politics and across local government. But this should be an opportunity to put your money where your mouth is and really say what it is you're going to be doing to tackle it. Thank you. Dr O'Brien? Just, just two, two final points. One, one is, uh, I, I guess, uh, we, don't, we shouldn't underestimate the whole question of policy transfer and how these models will be transferred across boundaries, local, national sort of boundaries, typically by consultants. Uh, so I think there's, there's, there's a kind of a, a process there, and the National Assembly of Wales is conducting its own re uh, review understanding into city deals and that report is due imminently so it'd be, be useful to look at that and the, the second point is that the UK cities minister Greg Clark did his PhD on incentive payment systems and when we interviewed civil servants in the UK government they said deal making was part of his DNA so I wouldn't underestimate that kind of uh, uh, part of the story as well. Okay thank you Christy. Um, no I'm not sure I've got much more to say other than I mean you know I think the one should apply a certain element of perspective to this. I mean, these these deals aren't going to make or break cities. There are wider global forces at work. I mean, if you look at... I mean, when I moved to Edinburgh in 1979, it was a sleepy provincial city. Through a combination of local government action and, you know, the, 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 the genetic makeup of Edinburgh, it's become the city it is today. You look at, for example, Liverpool's the classic example of where global forces are overwhelm any, anything that can be done done, done at local level. It's it's not an issue that I think we have any easy answers to. I mean, I remember the being involved in ring fence funding in the early part of the last decade when there were the Scottish government or the Scottish executive, as was, had projects such as the public transport fund and so on. And some of these issues are really just kind of being going through another cycle, and it's not you know this it's another pot of money that local authorities will scramble around to get, and sometimes. It doesn't necessarily affect what they would, in a you know, in a neutral environment, would would choose to pick. But it's what's available, and when they're hard pressed, that's what they'll go for. Thank you very much, Mr. Deep. Professor McLennan, any additional comments? 
Well, I, I think that uh, uh, what uh, uh, the government tries to do or has to do in terms of economic development and uh, the geography of Scotland, it's a tough ask. And it's a tougher ask now in many respects than it's been because where we now put our money and how it pays off uh, whilst meeting social objectives, it's got to contribute to the tax base in a way that was less of a constraint in the past than it is now. So how we, de de how we deal for the future is going to depend on how uh, places thrive, and the Parliament's resources will partly be determined or increasingly be determined by that. So territorial management, to use a good French phrase, uh, although they don't do it spectacularly well, but the phrase is the right one, actually thinking about how the larger cities, the city regions, the smaller cities, their connections to the rural are all important. I think that uh, you have the Scottish uh, uh, voice has already influenced city deals. Inclusive growth is now a discussion in England that it wasn't in, uh, until some of this arose out through the, the, the Scottish city deal context. So we do influence. I think you can take what is there as the city deals. They're a relatively small part of the capital flow, but think about how they fit into the broader strategic investments that the government and indeed local authorities and groups of authorities want to make. So I think there's a capacity to do something actually really interesting in the Scottish context and build on this rather than kind of scrap it. Very, very helpful. Can I, can I thank all our witnesses for, for giving evidence today? And as Mr Whiteman alluded to, we knew we were always going to be grappling and struggling a little bit with getting our heads around some of the city deal stuff. And this was our first evidence session here today, so it set the scene for us very well. We're very appreciative of that. If there's any additional information you want to drop an email to the committee clerking team to say, I wish I'd said this or said that, or here's an idea we think you should raise with the political leadership when, when they come and give evidence to, to, to this committee as well, don't hesitate to get in contact. So can I thank you all for, for coming along? And with that, can we now move into private session? Thank you.